Hi everybody, I'm Scott Goodson, the CEO of Strawberry Frog, the purpose activation company. Hey, I'm Scott O'Malan, of course, Scott O, Editor-in-Chief of Inc., a media brand that helps entrepreneurs start, launch, and grow their businesses. On behalf of Inc., Strawberry Frog, and RepTrack, we welcome you to the Purpose Power Summit 2021, a half-day program that will put a brand purpose under the microscope. Today, you will hear from a diverse line of speakers and conversations dealing with the impact of brand purpose on an organization's culture and its bottom line. We'll also focus on the key issue of activating that purpose to the people that matter inside the organization and out. And also, we'll explore what core values helped organizations weather challenges during a year of unprecedented crisis. We'll explore this and more, and later this afternoon, we reveal the results of the 2021 Purpose Power Index, the largest empirical study ever measuring perceptions of brand purpose. The study is based on more than 20,000 individual ratings from U.S. consumers. The results will reveal the brand purpose winners and laggards. I'm actually very excited to see who's going to win this year with that study. Uh, before we get started, though, Scott, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Truist. I'd also like to thank you, the Editor-in-Chief of Inc., Kylie Wright Ford, the CEO of the Rep Track Company. I'd like to thank all the wonderful speakers who are here today. And of course, everyone has worked so hard to make today possible. We would not be here without you. That's absolutely right, Scott. And we also want to thank all of you watching and joining us today as well. We think you'll find it fascinating as you watch the summit. Examples of how to activate purpose within your own companies and your own team will be everywhere. Our hope is that everyone walks away from today knowing the difference between top-down leadership and cross-company leadership in the age of purpose, and most importantly, what purpose means for companies. Helping business leaders gain perspective on purpose is something that really matters to us, and the Purpose Power Summit 2021 will help you get there. Now let's get started. Thank you for joining us this morning for the Purpose Power 2021 Summit. Tired of accepting the status quo in an industry slow to adapt, New York's largest healthcare provider, Northwell Health, decided to raise expectations for themselves and for the communities they serve of what health can and should be. To kick off the Purpose Power Summit, we have Northwell's CEO, Michael Dowling, and his Chief Marketing Officer, Ramon Soto, to talk about how activating its purpose helped to galvanize audiences, foster change, and forever raise the bar industry-wide. Gentlemen, welcome. Let me start with you, Michael. Uh, brand purpose, purpose, right? Such an important tool for success, and yet very often overlooked. How did you know uh, that you needed to um, uncover a purpose, and, and how did you go about figuring out what it was? Uh, we are the largest health system in New York State, and we are the largest employer. So we have uh, uh, we have the biggest provider of care, and we have all parts of the healthcare delivery system. But because of our scale and our size, we're also a major influencer and have the potential to be a major catalyst. And what is our role? Our role is to improve health overall, not just individual health, but in health overall for the community. And so we wanted to make sure that we represent that viewpoint to the public, that we're going to be different. We're going to be more creative, more entrepreneurial. We're going to take a broader view of health than the view that most people think. Most people think about health systems as dealing with illness only. But what we're all about is promoting health, the broader definition of health. That is our overall purpose. That's where I think we can have a unique role and uh, become an, an innovator for other health systems across the region and the country. So that doesn't necessarily make sense from a, a, a profit standpoint, right? You know, I, I have a, a spouse in healthcare. She records appointments. And if she doesn't have enough appointments in a week, that's problematic. That's where the money is made. How do you justify having um, this broader view of, of why Northwell exists when not all of it will filter directly, uh, you know, in, into your P&L? Well, there is enough illness around, unfortunately. And we will always be, have enough illness treatment uh, to be able to, uh, you know, make sure that the business side of the organization is successful. Uh, but we're going to be transitioning more and more because the reimbursement is going to be changing over time. 
so that we are going to increasingly become paid and get paid for actually health promotion, wellness, and prevention, and not just only for treatment of illness. So I'm not worried about the business implications of this. I, in fact, think that if we send a message that we are about overall health in general and influencing others to improve their health, that from a business point of view, we can, in, in fact, be doing the right thing, be doing the moral thing, and have a good business outcome at the same time. These are not inconsistent with one another at all. And if we have a health system and you're not in the business of promoting health and you're only in the business solely of just treating illness purely from the business point of view, then I think you lose your moral compass. And that's not where Northwell is. That's where Northwell wants to be. I think this is an exciting idea and in, in one that in other forms have, have proven to have a terrific ROI. So I, I applaud that. Ramon, uh, Purpose exists within an organization, but is also articulated outside of it. I, I want to talk about the inside first, right? When most of us think about uh, a healthcare business, you know, we think about who we interface with, right? And for most of the public, that's the doctors. And, and in fact, your organization includes executives like you, doctors as well, maintenance people, even volunteers. How do you articulate the, the purpose message to them in a way that they uh, absorb it and then can sort of move forward with that idea in mind? Yeah, Scott, it's a great question and, and thank you for inviting us here. Um, you know, this is really the, the intersection of culture and health. And it takes a very unique individual to um, really run towards the flames when consumers need us. And I think we saw um, a lot of the spirit and the ethos of our employees throughout the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, that was an exceptional view of who these individuals are. Um, but the reality is they practice this every day. They're in the business of uh, making sure that an individual gets to their best state of health. So it's actually quite easy to engage with them. Um, you know, Michael's built an extraordinary organization, 75,000 employees, um, over 5,000 physicians who are employed by the health system, uh, probably about 17,000 nurses, Michael. And uh, the, the reality is by uh, echoing their purpose, by uh, taking what they do every day and lifting it up, by um, really reinforcing the mission and the unique individual it takes to execute that mission, we've seen our employee engagement scores uh, rocket uh, over the last five years. Uh, I think we were in the 50, 50th percentile about five years ago. We're now in the uh, 92nd percentile in terms of employee engagement scores. There's really a pride of being here. Uh, that story in and, of, in and of itself tells itself. Uh, and we've also seen uh, from a metric standpoint, Northwell uh, increase as a best place to work uh, from a Fortune uh, 100 standpoint. I believe we're in uh, number 19. Number right 19. So, Scott, I think you see this, this pride e e echo itself in this organization in a very, very powerful way. And then that actually helps us establish the platform to tell the story on the outside. And let me just add something here also, Scott. Uh, all my people and employees at every level, from the security guard to the environmental worker to the laundry worker to the doc, I'm a strong believer that they just don't want to work for an organization. They want to belong to a cause. I think, uh, especially in the healthcare world, they want to have a mission, they want to have a focus, they want to know that you're doing something good overall for the community. That, I think, is part of the bonding aspect of the culture. And you've got to send that message broadly. And uh, when, uh, you know, for example, we talk an awful lot sometimes, and many times, especially this time of year on Memorial Day, we talk an awful lot about veterans. Well, that get extra gets extraordinary support. When we talk about gun violence as a health issue, as a public health issue, it gets extraordinary support. And I get inundated with, with memos and emails and texts from employees when we, uh, when we discuss these issues. So they understand that what they have got to do every day is X, but being part of something that does X plus, that we raise health overall, and by raising health overall and having that as a brand, we raise their expectations. 
We raise their sense of community, their sense of belonging. We raise their commitment to the culture. And the community around us sees the same thing. So I think uh, it's a different way to look at the organization. We just don't look at what we do only from the novel perspective of ROI itself. And obviously, we're not stupid. We are interested in, the, in making sure our business is sustainable. But I think our business will be more sustainable the more that we focus on raising health for everybody in the community and having that be our brand. I, I think it, it, that's a, a great insight in, in terms of uh, employee engagement as well, right? I think one of the things we've seen that the pandemic has done is uh, sort of suggested to a lot of people that uh, they should question work. Does work matter? What am I doing? Does it matter? And so organizations uh, with a well-defined purpose, I think, will retain employees um, and keep them more motivated than ones that don't as we start to return to normal. And as we see, I think, uh, a lot of uh, employee change across uh, across the landscape. You might have uh, insulated your, yourself from that. A question for either of you, uh, Ramon, you, you, you mentioned it uh, first, was that uh, you have folks who run toward the fire, essentially, in, in healthcare. Um, first responders, essential workers, people in emergency rooms, and uh, those emergency rooms have been more than full in the last year or so. How did uh, specifically your articulation of purpose help get you through the pandemic? Yeah. So Scott, it's a great question. Um, I will, I will suggest to you personally, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, I've never been more proud to work in an industry that uh, really put itself out there to, in our case, protect New Yorkers. Uh, New York was the early epicenter of COVID in the United States and Northwell being the large, largest healthcare provider was the epicenter of COVID in New York. And we saw individuals very selflessly put themselves out there uh, to protect us. And I will tell you, they were very scary days. Um, that sense of purpose, that um, you, you cannot uh, articulate that in a written form. You can't make that up. There is a spirit underneath that. Um, it is the, it's the fundamental root call of their calling. Um, it is, uh, it's something exceptional that allowed us to, to shape that purpose and really share back with them our pride in what they were doing, the support that we were going to offer them, um, that we were going to lead selflessly to make sure that they were um, empowered, um, that we removed bureaucracy, that uh, they had the tools that they need to practice their skill. And uh, we did that in a very reinforcing way to celebrate their service and the things that they were doing. So uh, purpose was uh, both embedded in their actions. And then we just simply reinforced that in terms of our original communications to let them know, to over communicate what we were doing, where we were going and how they were just an essential part of, um, of recovering from COVID. Uh, you know, I said it was the best of times, the worst of times. Uh, super proud about what we did. At the same time, the human strategy was, was uh, palpable and tremendous. That's actually created a long-term weight that, that we have to deal with. So the emotional well-being, the behavioral well-being of our workforce is really a key consideration right now. Who they are, And we'll do the same thing that we did during COVID. We're, we'll be there to support them. We will um, unleash resources to make sure that they're their best selves and uh, that they continue this, this pride, this esprit de corps, this execution of the mission that's so important to society today. I think that's one thing we haven't really reckoned with is the aftermath of, of the pandemic. Um, uh, the, not, only, not only the physical or, or uh, health effects um, that might linger for people, but also the emotional ones. So you think that uh, having an articulated purpose actually uh, helps folks. And I can imagine uh, that it not only motivates them uh, to, to, to go uh, back to work, but even uh, participate in uh, their own wellness, understanding that they're an important piece of, of, of society. Uh, and, and so uh, have to, have to, you know, continue on. Well, I, let me, let me just add on this, that, uh, you know, the COVID experience was a learning experience because if you ever were thinking or wanted to think 
about the importance of health overall and importance about health in its broadest sense, then you experience it during COVID because obviously we saw uh, certain communities being disproportionately affected by COVID. Uh, the, um, the employees saw it in each other because they were working each and every day in very, very dire circumstances, taking an, requiring an awful lot of courage and commitment and dedication, especially when their own families sometimes were in dire circumstances. So I believe that everybody that went through this has a different perspective about health now, a different perspective about what our responsibility and obligation is now, and a different pers pers perspective about how we all have to work together, which during COVID, every discipline, every part of the organization came together and worked together. And you talk about commitment and culture, right? After COVID, um, where, we, where we were at the epicenter at the beginning, but we need to relax a little bit at the in the beginning of the summer, and other parts of the country were in trouble, we put out a call to see if any of our employees, after going through what they went through here, whether they were interested in helping others in other parts of the country, we got thousands of positive responses of people who actually were willing to leave here, despite the fact of having dealt with what they had to deal with here, and go to other states. And we had hundreds of people go to other states. That shows an unbelievable commitment it, it, it shows true character. It shows what healthcare workers are made of and what they're all about. And what, quite frankly, it's a lesson for the rest of us. It's a lesson for other organizations of what you can do in a crisis to better the lives of others. And I do think that we will be better off because of COVID. And, and we're not going back to a, a, the old normal. That is a new normal now. The world is going to be different. And I think innovative organizations for every organization that wants to be innovative is not trying to reimagine what is the direction for the next decade and what we need to be doing differently. And I think we want to be at the forefront of that innovation and that creativity. We want to be able to be distinctive with what it is we do, because our job is not, in my view, not just doing what's good for us inside our own organization, is how we develop partnerships, how we influence others, how we get people to take responsibility, responsibility for their own health, how we, uh, how we look at issues that uh, we haven't looked at before in terms of their influence and health, like issues like environmental issues, climate change, gun control, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, COVID has changed us all. And if we look at it the right way, it has changed us all for the better. Let me, let me suggest uh, in addition to what Michael just said, the, uh, Culture is so important, and the, the culture that Michael has shaped here is exceptional. Um, and it's really driven top down. Uh, Michael embodies this view that you're either at the forefront of change or you're the victim of it. And um, the need to, to push forward was uh, really illuminated through COVID. We've seen the societal fractures, the economic, the social issues that are so apparent through COVID. And that desire to change, um, that desire to move forward, the desire to address issues that other health systems have not is part of the DNA of who we are and the culture. It adds to purpose. It adds to the reason to believe. Um, Michael brought up gun violence. Um, about two years ago, we launched an initiative to treat gun violence as a national healthcare epidemic, um, to really talk about the healthcare lane of gun violence not to treat it as a Second Amendment issue, um, but that is a very palpable example of dealing with the frontier issue that no other health system in the country had been dealing with, um, drawing attention to the cause, um, layering on the purpose of uh, why we do what we do, and driving that pride in the employee base. Uh, our, our employees responded very uh, strongly, very proudly, uh, they're part of our voice and moving this to a very different level. And, and we've seen some good progress in that regard. So, so you, you mentioned treating uh, health care as, as, I'm sorry, gun, gun violence as, as a, a public health issue. Um, you've talked about, I know, f food deserts as well and uh, fitness uh, activity. I, I often see uh, commercials on television for, for uh, healthcare organizations that focus on just how somebody got me 
uh, well. You're less transactional uh, than that. Uh, in, in being less transactional, um, it's harder to, to put an ROI on, on your communication. How do, you, how do you make that decision? What's appropriate to communicate? What's not to the public? Uh, and, and how do you know if you've hit the mark? Another example, I think I saw on television the other night that you are sponsoring a concert here in New York. Yes. So uh, I'll start, and, uh, and, and I'm sure Michael will join it. The, um, look, the reality is consumers have great choices in New York. Uh, we have strong competitors. You can get great care at a number of different places. So how do you differentiate yourself? And in our case, um, we really try to occupy a different territory than our peers. Uh, most of our peers um, speak in convention. And the convention is historically something like this. Um, I got injured, I got ill, I went to this wonderful place, I saw this fabulous doctor, I got better, insert logo here. Um, what we try to do is really speak to um, purpose in a way that reflects where culture and healthcare meet. And then we try to put the North Pole story right at the center of those two things. And it is a, it is a rich territory that allows us to speak about um, all the things that healthcare enables, uh, your life, your love, um, your career, your passions, um, a journey, a partnership. And once we embrace that territory, these realms of storytelling open up so that at the brand level, we can engage with consumers in a very different way. Uh, we have, uh, Michael and I have teamed up to build a destination healthcare brand that um, of course, we will fight for market share when the health event happens, but we want to have a relationship. Think longitudinally. Think about your healthcare journey um, uh, over time. And the stories that we tell are meant to evoke this positive view of who we are, what we do, and how we can take the journey with the individual. And we found purpose to be a very, um, very fertile territory. Um, we want better health for all, and we want to raise health, raise health of the community. And we recognize that as a partnership. We have an active role to take. We know consumers have their own active role to take to raise their own health. Uh, the flexibility of the platform really allows us to own that territory in a very unique way. And then we have to also fight for the transaction. So no margin, no mission. Um, I have to fight for individuals who are going through a health event and have them choose our, our facility. So there's more tactical work, almost performance marketing work that we do to ensure if somebody is going through a health event, they're going to come to our, to our space. Those two spaces very much complement each other and they're, they're integrated. They're born from each other. Um, and we found it's a very powerful platform. We've, we, we, um, have grown market share in our market. Uh, you know, we're the number one healthcare provider for a reason. About 50% uh, of our growth has been organic in nature and uh, consumer perception has never been higher. Uh, consumer awareness has never been higher. Net promoter score has never been higher. So all good traditional uh, metrics that you, you can point to for having gone through purpose. Michael, we're all, almost out of time. I wanna put the last question uh, to you, and, and that is, uh, there are a lot of other uh, CEOs, business founders, both large and small, uh, listening to us today. What is the one piece of advice you have for them around finding their own purpose? Well, I think it gets to the essence of what leadership is. So you can manage your organization, you can manage for the present, you can manage what was, or you can lead for the future. So what is the legacy you want to leave behind? How do you want to make a difference? How do you want to change the agenda? How do you want to change the talking points? Uh, so leadership is about creating a new future. And if there is any time to do that, right, post COVID, now is the time. So we have to pivot to taking on a more distinctive, different role. So if you're a CEO, you obviously have a responsibility inside your organization to change that and reimagine it, but you also have a major responsibility outside. As a CEO, you're listened to. Um, you have influence. Now, how are you going to use it? And in my view, 
you use it, and this is what we are doing and will continue to do and escalate it, is to raise health for everybody. So, for example, getting people back to work improves health. Generating a, a strong economy improves health. Having people employed instead of being unemployed improves health. What you do with housing improves health. Now, we can't do all of this ourselves, but if you want to be the leader, you can influence others to take a responsibility to do something about it. Catalyst role, which is very, very important. So I would say to other CEOs, when you get up in the morning and ask yourself the question, what do I really want to do today that's different? And, and I, I think from you, we've heard that today. And I think there's no uh, better benchmark for me than being able to say that um, uh, I'm, I'm grateful you're in the community uh, because it clearly makes a difference. Uh, Ramon, Michael, thank you both for being here today. I do so much more since I've been in the wheelchair and expected to do so much less, which is just irony. I was a networking and system engineer and life seemed great until it wasn't. They said you have a congenital condition, it's one in a million. Anyone would say that my brain injury happened to me, but I would say that it happened for me because I was able to turn the worst thing that ever happened to our family into the best thing that happened to other people. Even as someone with a disability, I'm able to still use my engineering skills to advocate for others and test new and exciting technology as someone with a disability. I go out and I support other people with disabilities. I hear what they want and what they need. And so trying out new equipment and giving feedback on new equipment is like being the voice of the voiceless. It's just a way to connect with my kids, to connect with others, and to prove that it's possible. And just so many incredible opportunities to be on both sides of technology. I get to do that in a way that brings adaptability forward, that will change the world and the way individuals with disabilities see and adapt to the world. It's not impossible to live forward after a life-changing event. Hi everyone, welcome back. And now we have a discussion with Bill Rogers, the President and Chief Operating Officer of Truist. Hey, welcome, Bill. Scott, great to uh, great to be here, and thank you for uh, hosting this uh, this event. It's a great day. What a pleasure to have you here. You're really one of the great thinkers when it comes to purpose, and I know because we've had the opportunity to work together for a, a while. And um, you've been through quite an interesting last couple of years. Uh, Truist is a new financial institution, the result of a merger between SunTrust and bb and how, how have you used purpose to guide this merger? Well, I, you know, Scott, one, thank you for the, for the nice compliment. I feel like you've uh, guided me along the way as well. So thank you for, uh, for all that. You know, the, the fantastic thing about Truist is it's a merger born of purpose. I mean, I, I really think that's that's how we think about it. When Kelly King and I started started talking about this, we we knew it would be a great financial success. I mean, it, the, the complementary businesses, the overlap, the revenue synergies, it, you know, expense opportunity, all, all that was there. We we just knew that, but we were both purpose-led. I mean, we had spent time together, we'd been in other meetings, and, and whenever the discussion gravitated towards purpose, we would gravitate towards each other. We would you know, find ourselves sitting next to each other. And so when we started talking about this, the whole concept and the code words that we used for ourselves, so it had to be for something. It needed to be for something bigger. It needed to stand for something. It needed to be purposeful. We wouldn't merge just to get big. We would merge to be better. We would merge to, you know, have more impact in the things that we want to do, uh, the impact we want to make on our communities, the impact we want to make for clients and teammates. So that, I, I really think, you know, just to be totally fair, as I said, it was a merger born to purpose. I mean, that was that was the very first conversation started in that in that framework. 
That's such an extraordinary uh, fact. I mean, you think about all the different strategies people try to think through when they're putting a merger together, but to start with purpose seems to be such a brilliant, uh, so, so, you know, simple, but yet brilliant thing to do. When you talked about uh, bringing these two organizations together, obviously you've got people that grew up or worked at BB&T for many years and people at SunTrust. How do you bring both of these cultures together with a new purpose? Yeah, and going back to the born of purpose, you know, we said we're, we're gonna create a new purpose. Um, and we've had both companies that had it in their DNA. I mean, the teammates were driven by purpose. They understood the why. That's how we talked. That's how we interacted. That's how we made decisions. But one of the really important things we decided with the merger, if we were going to be purposeful, we had to do it as one team. You, you can't have two cultures. You can't have two purpose. You can't have competing purpose. It, it had to be one. So we made a lot of these decisions early that we said we're going to have a neutral headquarters. We changed our name. We said we weren't going to have one name or the other. We weren't going to have winners or losers. We were going to have succession planning done. We were going to have a lot of these hard social decisions done up front. And the big decision was we were going to have one purpose. So we started our we started our meetings together and you know, we didn't we didn't day one said, let's go into the corner and let's, you know, let's divine the new purpose for the company because we each came at to at it. BB&T's was a little broader, uh, make the world a better place. Ours was a little narrower and lighting the way to financial well-being. Still the same concepts of, of driven by why. So we spent the first few months getting to know each other. We, you know, talking about the businesses, things we wanted to accomplish. And it was sort of like I don't know. I, I don't. I'm not a chef or anything. But like when you know the time's right, you know to take it out of the oven. We sort of knew the time was right to get people together and said, let's actually now start talking about our one purpose. And it was unbelievable. I mean, fantastic leaders sitting in a room. You could not tell who was from which heritage organization. All grounded purpose, fighting for all the right words. You know, fighting for you know the everyone you know uh, topping the other in terms of ensuring that w what we lock down is going to be something that is uh you know in indelible and and you know lives for you know generationally and builds upon both heritage but also really you know creates something uh, creates something new and sets that you know that bar i talked about earlier that's higher it's it's a for something kind of bar so our our purpose is to inspire and build better lives and communities and that's that's you know, that was the cornerstone. And then we had, you know, our mission and our values as the as the components of that. And the, you know, the 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 piece of that that's sort of the one up is the building better lives and communities. It was important to say lives and communities. So it is about one person and one interaction, but it's also about an entire community. So it's inclusive by by the you know capital I. And then the inspire part was we should actually just do it so well that others want to do it, that others want to follow our lead. And I think that's been the, the breakthrough part of the, of the wording in our purpose is that Inspire thing is causing us to every decision we make, the investments we make and the community involvement we have, we sort of stop and say, is that inspirational? You know, is it is it big enough? Is it bold enough? Is it purposeful enough to to be inspirational not only to our own teammates but to others. I mean, you've been quite a trailblazer in this space for a long time. It's now it's starting to become very popular. You know, the business roundtables start talking a lot about purpose. Right. But you've really um, been doing this quite a while. And your description of the kitchen sitting in there where you were putting the ingredients together. Uh, it sounds fascinating. How, how was that? Was that did it happen in one evening or did it take many weeks? You know, we did it over a couple of days. Uh, we did ask someone to help facilitate, which was not someone to lead the purpose because we thought that's what we do. I mean, that's that's who we are. But someone to help facilitate that was uh, that was beneficial. And in my literally 40 years of, of, of a career, I'd say it's the best two days I've ever spent you know, working with people that I'd worked with for a long time, others that I had not worked with a long time, and all of a sudden found, you know, kindred spirits, uh, you know, people who wanted to lead a different way, people who wanted to, uh, you know, have purpose be a foundation of a, of a company that we were going to build together, uh, the most rewarding work. And, and it 
came together fairly quickly. Uh, and as I said, the you know people would, you know, fight for different words. Uh, we have a value of happiness as an example. Uh, that was a heritage BB&T value. It was not one for uh, for SunTrust. I, I fought as hard as I could. I said, you know, we have to have a company that has happiness as a value. I mean, that, that's got to be the cornerstone of a purposeful company. And if you think about what we've been through in the last year, to have a value of happiness that we can actually talk about with teammates and talk about how important that is and talk about the journey of happiness, not the destination, uh, to, you know, to talk about the, the how, how important it is and the components of how giving to others is the component that builds happiness, all the things that go along with that. That's been a it's been a an, an incredible glue component of the of the purpose journey in the middle of a pandemic as just one little small example. Uh, it's extraordinary. And to think that you minted this purpose and then you wake up and there's a global <laughs> pandemic. I mean, it just brings me to my my next question. Like, how did having the purpose help you lead through, I guess, a world where no one really knew what was going to happen? We made a decision, Scott, early. And, you know, you look back in life and, you know, there's serendipitous moments. And, and this was one of them is we, you know, we, we merged our company on the 1st of December of 2019. And we said, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to go out and we're going to touch as many teammates as possible. We went to 38 physical locations, you know, probably touched somewhere maybe close to 20,000 teammates, you know, physically in a room, of course, got to everybody virtually. And all we talked about was purpose, mission, and values. We didn't talk about strategy. We didn't talk about financials. We didn't talk about technology. We didn't talk about anything but purpose, mission, and values. And we said, that's, that's what we want the new team to know that that is the first thing that's on our mind. In our investor presentation, uh, in our first you know, annual report, in our first investor presentation as a new company, the first slide was purpose. You know, we just wanted to. We just wanted to be conscious with everybody that that was going to be our lead. That was our first step. Was always going to be in purpose. So, you know, the value of that was we did that first. So when we so when the pandemic hit, you know, and and everybody you know goes into their corners and the world's upside down. Nobody has any pandemic plan. We had set a foundation. Uh, you know, it wasn't as strong as it's going to be because, you know, you build on it continuously. You always, But we had set a really strong foundation. So we, when, when we went into making decisions during the pandemic, we had a foundation to do it and we could bring it back to that to that foundation. So when we um, uh, as an example, we we consciously said we have to do something significant to contribute to our communities, it's got to be big and bold and it has to be fast uh, because the, the world is upside down. And we have to, if we're going to inspire and we're going to build better lives and communities, we got to do something right now. So over a weekend, you know, we came up with a $25 million, you know, plan called Truest Cares to, to distribute to our communities. And because we've done that, all of our region presidents, the people who lead all this, they knew what to do. They were ready to go. They were ready to 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 engage because we'd set that foundation. So those are just some of the examples. And then, then decisions we made about uh, teammates. You know what we what we needed to do to provide you know additional support for our teammates was all under our value of caring. So when we said this is what we're doing, it's under our value of caring. So we we always because we led with that we could tether all of our decisions back to purpose for our for our teammates. I actually remember the day when I think we were sitting there and obviously in New York, things were quite difficult and the message came that we were going to work on with Truest Cares. It was such a clear moment, just what we need to do. I think Truist was the first financial institution to come out with a message about what you were doing in the community. And later in this presentation today or the summit, we're going to reveal the purpose power index of right. um, the most purposeful brands in the country. And I think Truist is going to show up quite well, actually, in that uh, in those results. 
Um, but well, now, well, now, now it's now it's a competition. So you know, we're going to be we're going to be number one for this is all over with. <laughs> well, I think we'll, let's keep uh, let's keep our eyes on 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 this uh, result today because I think you you're actually looking pretty good. So that brings me to my last question: How are you bringing the purpose that you just spoken about to people in the communities in which you operate? I mean, you talked a minute ago about truest cares. But are you uh, bringing it to life in ways that are actually helping uh, your consumers and the markets and your employees? You know, Scott, and you and I have talked about this a lot. First of all, it has to be in every action we take. I mean, I think one of the challenges is people associate purpose and philanthropy as the only connection point. Purpose is actually in every action you take. So the actions we took in the pandemic in terms of modifications, forbearance, all the, all the things that we needed to do to help our clients during this particular time, all those were grounded in purpose. I mean, I think that's the way that you impact lives and, and, and communities. That being said, we also did a lot of the things in the area of philanthropy. You know, we, we, we did, uh, as part of Truist Cares, we did a safety net thing first and said, okay, we gotta go to the organizations that need us most. You know, you've got sort of that, that, that core hierarchy of need in terms of food and shelter and, and those type issues. And then we said, what are the other bigger things that we need to, uh, uh, to focus on? We did, we partnered with a client on something called Truist Connects. And what we tried to come up with was a concept of creating broadband capacity uh, and a PC uh, to communities that were most in need that didn't have that capability. So we just tried to look at what were the unique needs of the community in a pandemic uh, and what were the areas that we could address uh, in a purposeful way that was fast and uh, not, not we didn't want credit, but we'd be recognized that it was purposeful in terms of how we, how we did it and, and, and intentional. When you're making these decisions, whether it was Truest Cares or what you just spoke about, do you find yourself automatically going back to your purpose to check your thinking and your gut? I think if you don't do that, you really need to question whether you're a purpose-driven company. And in and, and, and fairness, it's, it's hard to do every day, every time, but, but I think certainly at the broadest sense, but absolutely. I mean, there is no doubt that, you know, in the middle of a you know, every day session during the pandemic that we would stop, you know, literally do the pause and ask ourselves, is this purposeful? You know, is, is this purposeful, this decision we're making? Is it consistent with our purpose, mission, and values? And sometimes it isn't. You, you, you know, you might say, well, gosh, we're, we're going too slow. If we're going at this speed, we're really not living our purpose. Or it might be a decision that says, you know, this impacts a client in a way that's not purposeful. Maybe may may be beneficial for a, for a shareholder, but it's not beneficial. It's not purposeful for what we want to do with the client. So, absolutely, you've got to pause. And we, you know, you, you do all the things that are important. We have it posted everywhere. I mean, I, I can't be in an office or a conference room or something that our purpose is not sitting there. And that's not a branding thing. That's a reminder. You know, that's not a it's not a marketing thing. It's it's a it's just a reminder just to to look out of your corner of your eye and say, Oh yeah, that's that's right. I mean, today I'm in the I'm in an inside my conference room is the Inspire conference room that I'm speaking to you from. So, you know, when I walked in the door, I thought to myself, Okay, I just got challenged to 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 inspire. Well, it's been very inspirational and I don't think I've ever heard of a merger where purpose was the first strategy. That really is quite remarkable. So Truly inspirational to hear about how the two organizations are coming together. And I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. And, and Scott, thank you. Thank you for your purposeful leadership and friendship. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, and thanks for joining us at the Premier Purpose Power Summit, brought to you by Inc. Magazine, Strawberry Frog, and the RepTrack Company, and sponsored by Truist. We're here with leaders of purpose-driven brands to discuss the impact an organization's mission can have, not only on itself, but outwardly, in its industry, and in fact, the world. We'll hear how vital purpose is to these companies in any given year, but especially in times of crisis. Stay tuned for fascinating discussions on all the ways authentic purpose can both guide and support a company. Here's a look at the program.
Hi again, I'm Scott Goodson, CEO and founder of Strawberry Frog. And now we're going to turn our attention to transforming the culture of the organization, using purpose to change the habits, the mindsets, the behaviors, the rituals of employees. And that, that's a really, I think, fascinating uh, discussion. Um, I'm going to be joined by three genuinely cool leaders. Christy Pambianchi, who's the Executive Vice President, uh, Chief Human Resources Officer of Verizon. I'm also going to be joined from Amsterdam by Stacey Tank, who is the Chief Transformation and Corporate Affairs Officer at the Heineken Company. And I'm also going to be joined uh, by Stephen Fry, the Senior Vice President and Human Resources and Diversity at Eli Lilly. Welcome, Christy, Stacey, and Stephen. After the past year, wow, what a year. Uh, it seems that time has come for leaders who focus on the people and the talent inside organizations to take a leading role in activating purpose. They're doing this to deal with the culture and behavior change that needs to be addressed and also issues of well-being. And I'll address these questions to, all, to each of you, um, but how do you, how do you see purpose as a change tool for the culture of your company. Maybe we could start with you, Christy. Great, thank you so much, Scott. And it's great to be here on this panel with, with all of you and really looking forward to this discussion. You know, purpose is such an important concept because it really helps um, customers and employees know what your company's overall uh, why is and what is it about and why does it exist? And it really helps employees connect their own why with the why of the organization. And so when you think about a culture transformation, if you can find a purpose, that's something employees connect to, it becomes a catalyzer to driving that transformational change, driving that culture, and really having sort of this huge connectivity between individuals, personal goals, and the corporation's purpose. And to me, there's like an exponential unlock that happens. Fascinating. I know that Verizon's going through a change of a new CEO, and Christy, you um, have been with the firm for, I believe, a year and a half or two years. Um, what about uh, Heineken? Obviously, a very established, well, re highly regarded uh, company and brand. How, is, how do you think about purpose, uh, Stacey? Oh, Scott, thank you. Really great to be here as well. I came into this purpose space maybe 10 years ago. And I came in begrudgingly. I came in to exploring purpose and absolutely did not get it. I worked in an organization that was a little bit more serious and more linear in its thought process. And as I was working at Heineken for the first time when I joined the company, our CEO at that uh, operating company, now our global CEO, was really intrigued by this idea that you could unleash something as an exponential kind of factor, if you could put your finger on that unique truth that is your why. And the way we came into it was actually through individual purpose. And that was the big uh, unleash factor for me where all the Legos clicked into place. We went with our executive team into the woods for a few days and we reflected on our lives, all the crucible moments that had shaped us and when I was six years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, 18 years old, what were the patterns of my life that truly made me who I am? Why is the room different when I show up? And how do you do that pattern reflection? And really interestingly, through the sort of observations of your colleagues, mirroring this back to you to help you articulate your individual reason for being. And once I was able to, to feel that in my bones and the power of knowing my unique why, we then applied it to the organization. And it was a huge sort of accelerator and all of us understanding more innately in our DNA, the power that purpose can bring to unleash an entire organization. And purpose for me has never been something that you invent or something that you you find or, or search for, it's really reflecting on something that's always been there, finding shared language to put around that unique superpower. And of course, it should stretch you to be the best expression of that thing, but it's really at your core something that has always been incredibly unique to who you are, whether that's as a person or as a company. 
Stephen, obviously this past year has put uh, pharmaceutical companies into the forefront like never before. How do you look upon purpose and has it changed the way you, you know, think about purpose over the last few months? Thanks, Scott. And again, thank you as well for the invitation to be a part of the program today. Um, yeah, look, we're a 145-year-old company, and I would have said that our founder, Colonel Eli Lilly, when he started the company, really it was driven by a purpose of providing innovative research-based medicines to people who need them. And that's still our purpose today. Um, you know, we unite caring with discovery to create medicines for people. And I think the pandemic, while that's always been true, I think the last year and a few months um, has brought that to the fore like never before. Um, one of the things that we try to do a lot is connect our employees to um, patients who rely on our medicines. Um, we start most meetings and end most meetings with some sort of patient story to understand the kind of impact that our medicines and other medicines in the industry have on, have on people. This past year and a half, when the pandemic started, we immediately started to say, what can we do to help uh, fight this um, horrific thing happening around the world? And um, literally within record time, we had employees who were probably more focused than ever on making a difference because they knew that we that the world was relying on us and, of course, others in the in the industry. Um, in our particular case, we had research teams that immediately started to look for antibodies that could that could fight the coronavirus. And, you know, we were fortunate that literally within months, nine months or so, we discovered, developed, manufactured and deliver to patients antibodies that um, save thousands of lives, um, not only in this country, but around the world. Um, and I think our employees now more than ever have connected to our, to our purpose um, in, in a, just a direct, a direct way. It's interesting, I recently read a Harvard Business Review article that said employees who are connected to a culture driven by purpose are 30% less stressed and 50% more focused. And I can tell you that in the last a year and a bit through the pandemic, there's no question that our employees had been at least 50% more focused uh, because of the difference they can make for people around the world. That's fascinating. Uh, I mean, those are three great uh, examples of how you are thinking about purpose for three completely different sectors. People think that Simon Sinek discovered why, but I think Viktor Frankl was the first philosopher who said, you know, searching for man's meaning. And so Stacey, it was a very eloquent way of, you know, bringing that experience you had to life. Um, and I think we all kind of go through that when we're trying to find a purpose that's relevant for the organizations we work for. I think it's particularly interesting, you know, purpose as a, as a tool to change the culture of a company um, and the habits, behaviors, rituals of, you know, people who work, the teammates, associates uh, inside. Do you have examples of how purpose is being used in your organization, how it might be changing the culture or changing the way people behave uh, inside your organization? Christy, do you have any um, examples you might want to share with us? Yeah, the thing that's been so interesting at Verizon, we are on a transformation called Verizon 2.0. And really, the concept of the fact that we need to transform the company from a position of strength. We had brought uh, the 4G networks to bear uh, for all of our customers, they very, very successful, very capable, but we knew the 5G technology node was happening and we wanted to be first and being able to build that out. So what we launched was a whole transformation program based on the fact that what got us here won't get us there. And we wanted people to know we were really successful and we're really excited about those results, but we needed the team to really um, think about this next challenge differently. And so we focused on the ways of working that we needed to embed in what we thought was going to be critical to achieving 5G. And that was gonna be that we needed highly agile, empowered teams that could really work at speed and innovate a lot of cross boundary focus. And we actually reorganized the whole company instead of being product oriented to be customer oriented. So we created a consumer and a business and a media facing unit. And so in order to really bring that home for everybody, we finalized a really simple purpose statement that is, quote, we create the networks that move the world forward. And then we worked hard to help everybody understand what their new organization was, 
how it tied to the purpose and what the ways of working were going to be that were going to enable us to achieve that purpose and give people license to adopt these new ways of working. And it's been incredibly exciting and catalyzing. And we did, uh, we called it Leadership Edge and Edge Training for all employees to really kind of practice exercises of these new ways of working, but all toward empowering people and allowing for much more cross-functional agile teams to form. And you can do that. You can unleash empowerment. You can unleash giving people a lot of autonomy in their roles when there's unity on the purpose and what is it that you're actually trying to accomplish and why you're trying to accomplish it. Because that gives people not only something to affiliate with and feel like my why matches the purpose of the company, but also now that I understand that, I'm going to be able to make good decisions with data and teammates around me. And that was what we were really trying to unlock, which is the whole power of, we call it the V team. You know, if we have 135,000 employees, how can we unlock the whole power of the V team working in a common direction, serving our customers, serving the market, serving the world, and then at the same time, finding personal fulfillment. I know when you were on the journey of, of, of your work, um, you had to think about some of the, um, I guess, ways that the orthodoxies that you had and get beyond those in order to develop a new culture. Could you talk a little bit about that? I, I found that quite fascinating. Yeah, we, in, in this Leadership Edge program, and we, you know, and we got great reactions from employees as well. We actually had people reflect on um, what were the orthodoxies that existed in the organization that might need to change or go away in order to unlock the potential and bring the Verizon 2.0 ways of working to life. And by doing sort of exercises around it with starting with senior leaders all the way down to our frontline teams, it sort of empowered people to call them out and identify them as these are orthodoxies or sort of unwritten rules or things that are out there in the organizational culture, which is really what they are, these rituals and habits that might need to be re-examined in light of the future direction of, of where we were heading. And not in any way to say they may not have served, they probably served the company very well uh, under what the objectives were to get to where we were. And by we actually do table exercises, report it out, and it, it, it gave people a, a feeling of like freedom and power to confront it and feel safe, potentially um, creating and adopting new rituals. So I, I, I really enjoyed the conversation, Stacey, about the, the woods and the trip. But it's like a deep reflective moment mm -hmm. away from it to just say, what are those orthodoxies? And we had, you know, a lot of formality in the structure and there was you know obviously a lot of very detailed operational reviews we're a company that operates at scale no customers want an outage we have incredibly high reliability standards etc um but we felt to go to 5g and the innovative uh, space that we needed to go to we needed to unleash a lot more of that creativity and autonomy and, and agile working between teams and in order to do that we would probably then have less emphasis on hierarchy, less emphasis on, you know, detailed, exhaustive reviews. Obviously, we're still attentive to detail, but um, really giving people the freedom to say, hey, this is a working session. Uh, we don't need 18 pre-meetings before the meeting. Let's just have the meeting. Mm -hmm. And that was a little bit of a pause. Like you could just see even senior, you know, leaders, a few levels around the leadership team of the company wondering if we were serious about it. And the way we were able to break down the orthodoxies was not only inviting people to identify them, but then have us, the CEO and his team, really lead by breaking the orthodoxy. It is so fascinating. Stacey, um, you know, when we think of Heineken, it's the truly global company. I mean, everywhere I've traveled, and I've traveled a lot in this world, <laughs> there's always Heineken. How do you use a purpose to... First of all, to unite a global or genuinely global organization and then change that culture and or habits of the people working. Heineken is super global and 157 year old fourth generation family uh, company. We're uh, still having our largest shareholder as Charlene Heineken from the Heineken family. And knowing that we have employees everywhere from Papua New Guinea to Sierra Leone to Peru uh, and every country in between, 
There's a beautiful localism and entrepreneurship to that. When we build a brewery, we're there for 80, 90, 100 years. But as you say, you need strong values, you need strong culture, you need a strong articulated purpose to create that connective tissue and help everyone feel like they belong to that one big green family. So we interestingly had articulated purpose in many of our operating companies, but as a global company in 157 years, we've actually never articulated a collective purpose. So we are in that process now. We spent time listening to tens of thousands of consumers and tens of thousands of employees to get their input. We actually last week just did a synthesis with our executive team for a few days to start to kind of hone and identify the patterns. And we'll shortly this fall be bringing purpose uh, for the first time to employees. But I've seen whether it was at the Heineken US business where I started with the company originally, where I took a brief departure and went into retail with Home Depot, where we also did purpose work there and uncovered that Home Depot was all about empowering the doer in all of us. And by having that doer language and that doer lens, we could think about our foundation and our philanthropy differently from putting 20,000 skilled tradespeople from the military into the US economy to how we are creating an experience in the stores when you're bringing people into doing, whether it's workshops, et cetera, teaching, making it easy for folks to do projects to inspiring through digital content, that moment of satisfaction when you have done it, when you've accomplished it and you've got your hands on your hips, admiring your work. It was just an incredible lens uh, to be able to prioritize and, and focus I think purpose, whether it's individual purpose or company purpose, it's like a map. It helps you remember how to get home. And uh, my Sherpa on this subject of, of purpose, who helped me originally with individual purpose, is a guy named Nick Craig. And his purpose is to wake you up and help you realize that you're home. And I think that's what purpose does. It wakes you up and makes sure that you are standing in that uniqueness so that you can be the best expression of whatever that purpose is. That's great. I love that thought. <laughs> um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, how about you? I mean, how is purpose or how do you use purpose to change, you know, the culture now that we've been through this last year? You know, obviously the organization has probably, you know, felt highly motivated because of what's been happening. But how do you channel that? How do you use purpose to achieve your business objectives? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Maybe let me start with just a little bit of our story about how we even defined our purpose. Um, a few years ago, we also went through a CEO transition. And interestingly, at the time, uh, he said, let's not change anything about sort of our expectations, our culture, our mission, et cetera. Let's just keep going. But we heard a lot of feedback from our employees with a lot of energy around our purpose at the time. And we did an inventory of sort of mission statements, vision statements, behavioral expectations, all these things over a period of time. And just walking around our facilities and campus, you could see, you know, words from years ago that we stopped using. And we decided that we needed to do an exercise to really simplify for our team both internally and externally, what the company was all about. And it, it actually ended with a purpose statement. So we got rid of mission statements and vision statements and completely focused in on our purpose, which, as I said earlier, is Lily Unites Caring with Discovery uh, to create medicines to make life better for people around the world. Um, and that's where we are today. We've not changed that. Now, of course, that purpose statement is not, does not, is not good enough on its own. Um, it takes employee action and a culture to help uh, drive that. So we have underneath our purpose statement, a culture really defined by two things, our three, our core values, um, which are integrity, um, um, quality, and respect for people. I um, mean, I think if you were to go do, you know, an unaided uh, question to all of our employees around the world, you would get 98% recall on those values. They've been around for a long, long time. But we also defined and simplified what we call the expectations that we have of our employees to drive our purpose. Um, and those are first include because we know we have to have an environment and a culture where everybody can be respected, valued, welcome, and heard. We need the best minds around the world if we're going to compete 
uh, in this industry that we are uh, that we are competing in and make a difference for patients. Um, we want to innovate, not just with big breakthrough medicines, but literally in our everyday work and just improve constantly how we work to make a difference for patients. We want to accelerate. We've got to be more agile. We have to be faster. And finally, of course, we want to deliver. So those are our four employee expectations that we now have integrated into every part of our HR processes or every part of our work in the company uh, to reinforce what our expectations are that will drive towards that purpose. And that has been a tremendous change effort for us over the last three to four years. Um, and I think, as I said earlier, our, our employees now are probably better connected to our purpose uh, than any moment in our history. And we reinforce this constantly with making sure we connect employees to what we're doing and the difference where we are making for, for patients. This has been an incredibly interesting session. We could go on, I'm sure, for another hour. Uh, we only have five minutes left, but just quickly, I was going to ask each of you if you have an example of how purpose has helped you through difficult times in the last year. I think you know our industry and certainly our company, our, our work has never been clear why we, why we do what we do. Uh, the pandemic has brought this out. And I think that um, more than ever, the, the need that patients have, and by the way, not just with COVID, but diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, um, these devastating diseases that people are afflicted with, um, our employees are globally wake up every morning wanting to make a difference for people. That's why people stay with our company um, uh, for so long. And we're going to keep that that sort of mantra and continue to drive purpose because we think, again, if, if, we're, if we can continue to be a purpose-driven organization, we will have more engagement, more energy, uh, more commitment than ever from, uh, from our team. And they're the ones who, who the, our team are the ones who discover and make medicines. Um, they don't make themselves. So thanks for having me again. I'll jump in, just building on, on those comments. What Obviously, COVID was it just a tremendous crisis that called all of leaders to action. And, and so in our case, as we were navigating the early phases of, uh, of COVID and the pandemic going from you know, Asia to Europe to the U.S. during that Q1 of 2020, we actually were able to say, you know, we're going to approach this through the lens of our purpose. How do we, if it's we create the networks that move the world forward, how do we keep people connected through this crisis and keep our people safe? And every time we were confronted with a new dimension of the crisis that was right at the center of how we thought of our response, how we talked to our employees about it. And then you had the compounding of then the racial and social justice crisis that started just a year ago yesterday with George Floyd's murder. And again, we were able to leverage that to think about how do we respond, have a voice in, um, in the community around the need for racial justice and how can we be a leader in and outside our company in that regard. And really it's continued. We're, we're about 15 months now into the crisis management that many of our firms have been in. And the purpose has really been this glue at the center of um, keeping us all together, keeping us thriving, and I think has just been an immense uh, benefit to our organization as we all leaned on each other to cope and 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 take care of of our of our our customers and our employees. To avoid being repetitive, such beautiful things shared and really resonated with a lot of my experiences too. Maybe a, a personal anecdote from a few years ago, actually, in a time of crisis, different kind of crisis, but where I was running a couple of businesses for Home Depot that were very much in a turnaround, and it was tough stuff. There were some very challenging, emotionally challenging things going on beyond business shrinking double digits uh, that really affected people and their ability to make uh, an income, and I was getting a lot of engagement and tough uh, feedback, good, helpful, direct feedback in many ways from employees all over the business across the, the U.S. about how tough it was, how much it was affecting their marriages, how it was affecting their children. And there were nights I was working till, you know, 10, 11 in the office, and I would just look out at the Atlanta skyline and I would think, what am I doing? Why am I here? Why did I think that I could come and help and, and, and get us back to growth? I don't know how, you know, there are so many unsolvable problems. The list of things that we have to tackle is so long. It almost feels impossible to know how to prioritize. 
And the number of email, you know, thousand emails in, you can never, you know, it just feels like you're on a treadmill to nowhere and you cannot uh, keep your little nose above the waterline. And one of those nights I was looking out the window and thinking and feeling really dejected. And I had a framed print of my individual purpose statement that my former team had given to me. Mm. And my eyes fell on that frame And my individual purpose is to ignite the worthy fight and blow your hair back. And it was like somebody put the paddles on me and woke me up. And I thought, okay, I know why I'm here. I'm here to ignite the worthy fight. This is a worthy fight. We can do this. And from that moment forward, I had a different sense of belief. And I stepped into the shoes that I was supposed to be standing in to serve that organization in the moment when they needed someone with that purpose. I was meant to be there. So it was my map. It woke me up and reminded me that I was home. And it let me navigate through and get the business. We got the business back to double-digit growth and did some just wonderful things together. But it was it went back to purpose. And if it can do that for one purpose, one person... If you can do that for an organization, it is a true force, force multiplier. I was thinking, you know, during the last year, um, for me, the example that I use is a being a bit like a captain of a sailing ship. You know, if the when the when the water's calm, it can be quite boring. But when the waves get huge and the wind blows, if you don't have a deep rudder, which in effect is the purpose, you really kind of go all over the place. You're tackling, particularly if you're a leader of a large organization, you don't have that grounding. And I think all of you in your own way sort of conveyed that sentiment today. So this has been really incredibly um, interesting, deeply illuminating on how purpose is being used inside companies, transform, motivate. And so I deeply appreciate you joining us, Christy and Stacy and Stephen, really helpful, really inspiring for all of us. And um, I just want to close out by saying, please join us for the sessions that are about to come. This is the largest purpose summit of 2021. I've been joined uh, by Christy, Stacy, and Stephen, three incredible leaders who are making change happen through purpose inside their large organizations. Thanks everyone for joining us. This has been a truly great panel. Uh, Please stay tuned. We've got some amazing sessions coming up for the Purpose Power Summit. How do we move from toothless purpose to action? How do we move these these CEOs from woke to warrior? How do we get them to actually do something? That's the big question. And are there any companies out there that you guys have noticed that are grabbing this by the collar and actually doing something? People are raising their consciousness. And because of that, I think it's really making companies and leaders have to answer to the communities, the people who live in the communities, because they really are, they want answers. They want to understand what these companies are thinking and feeling. So when you asked about companies, like one came to mind and it's a form of action, like, and we can talk about all the components of what action means, but it's what companies are saying. That's also a part of this um, movement. So, you know, Nike started to jump in the forefront for me just because they've been very active and in the forefront of making sure throughout this pandemic that they're representing people that have something to say and may not have had a platform to actually say it. Welcome back. And now for our next session, we have a wonderful guest and a good friend of mine. His name is Ranjay Gulati. He's a professor from the Harvard Business School. And some say he's the CEO whisperer. Welcome to our Purpose Power Summit. 
Thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and thank you for having me here today with you. It's a pleasure. So why don't we jump in? Um, what, in your opinion, can purpose do for CEOs? Purpose to me was in some ways like wallpaper. You know, it was this thing that every company had, but no one did anything with. And, and I believe that too. It was like, oh, really a mission statement, whatever. And I've come to realize what an underutilized resource. What an underutilized resource. It's such a fundamental, it's so simple, and yet it can be really so profound and deep in its impact on companies. Not only does it give you directional clarity, because it addressing the purpose forces you to think clearly about why are we here? What do we want to do? What do we not want to do? It also forces you to think about, to get connected to the right kind of employees who want to work for you. There's a self-selection matching that happens. People come to you for the right reasons, not for a job, but for some affiliation with that purpose of yours. Your customers, you start to filter out your customers. Sure, you'll have may have fewer customers, but different customers, but ones that are much more loyal. And then, of course, it allows you to think about connecting to your community at large. Uh, I think the mistake we think of now in the modern version of purpose right now is purpose is a tax on doing business. And that is such, such a, I would say, incorrect and I would say a myopic view of purpose. Hmm. Yeah, it seems like the simple is often uh, avoided if you're the CEO. You need something complicated <laughs> work with. Um, what does purpose mean for employees? Well, let's think about employees first for a second. First of all, we all have an individual level of purpose, which is what is my life purpose? Why am I here? Right? We all, and work is part of our life purpose. So, you know, yes. And, and some of us decide our life purpose has nothing to do with work. Work is work. It's the segregated, bounded set of activity that has nothing to do with my life. I have a different purpose. Could be my family, my community, my you know, uh, organizations to which I belong, my hobbies. Could be anything. That's my real purpose. So there's a purpose we have. And then there is what you say, the organization's purpose. And, and we are trying to find an intersection between these two kind of focal points in our lives and connect them in some meaningful way. And if you look at, for instance, what Satya Nadella and Kathleen Hogan at Microsoft have done, they've done a masterful job in trying to find a way to connect these two ideas. And, and in fact, they even say that, you know, don't ask what you can do for Microsoft, but ask what can Microsoft do for you? Ooh. We want you to live your life purpose. Yeah. And we want to support you in that journey. That's quite a shift. Um, I think that it's such a galvanizing power for employees to, to hear that from leaders. Uh, in your opinion, um, when CEOs that you talk to and you work with, when they think about purpose, do they think about how it can help change the company, transform the company, how it can change the mindsets of their employees or their employee habits? Is that, is, they, is that how they're thinking about it? Well, I think, the, of course, the answer runs the gamut, right? There are those who kind of are on the more enlightened end of the spectrum where they really understood the potential of purpose. They see it as, you know, not just a rallying cry, not just, but it's a, it's a galvanizing force and a, a way to org change the organizing principle in your organization how people think about work, how people think about their relationship to the work, how they think about their connection to the organization, to the customers, to community at large. And this, and it taps into, I would say, some really uh, uh, building an emotional connection to work. And, 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 and that becomes kind of part of this whole story then. How do you think purpose, you know, all things being equal, you know, competitive salary and benefits and uh, you work for a great company, how important is purpose when to, uh, you know, attract great talent or even retain talent coming out of COVID? So, look, I think we all know 
th- there hasn't been enough research on this topic yet. People have studied culture, which is, I would say, a uh, rela- adjacent construct to purpose, but distinct. And they found people opt into cultures, but there's growing evidence that people actually opt into a purpose of an organization. They, but not everybody will opt in, right? So there's a self-selection matching going on. I'll just give you an example. I just wrote a case on a company called Livongo. And Livongo sold last year to Teladoc. Uh, but you know it was one of the fastest growing health tech companies for creating a platform for people with chronic disease, diabetes being the first, but also hypertension and others. Uh, two thirds of the people who chose to work at this company have a connection to diabetes and chronic illness, either in themselves or their family members, right? They were located in Silicon Valley, right down the road from Google and Facebook and others. They had no issues attracting top talent. Mm. And without having to pay over market wages, people wanted to be there. Now that's one thing is to get the talent. The other question that I don't have an answer to is productivity. What do we know about productivity of people? And we know that, you know what, it's not just about satisfaction, it's about being inspired. And what does that do to our ability to focus and be more productive? Yeah, that's a, it's fascinating. I mean, clearly there's a deep passion for those that work at Livongo and um, connection to diabetes. We actually talked to, when you were having your um, clubhouse session with the founder, Glenn, and I asked the question of whether CEOs that are enlightened around purpose have experienced some form of suffering. Um, and uh, he, he thought that was a funny question. There's a kernel of something you said there just now, mm. that to really make this idea of organizational purpose stick, there are two parts to it. One of us, you have to be convinced that it's going to help performance, right? Yes, we don't have the definitive study to nail that down, but we at least can anecdotally, logically piece together that it, it's likely to have a positive effect on performance. This is not purpose and performance go together. The other part that you just said was purpose is personal. Hmm. It's not an abstract idea. You know, it has to be feel personal to the leader. I do this because it is meaningful to me. It's not just a concept that seems like a good strategy. So let's put it out there. It's it's extension of who you are. And so great purpose leaders tell personal stories about why that purpose is meaningful to them. Well, it's like Viktor Frankl, obviously, who went through the Second World War, was a concentration camp victim, and then, you know, came out of the war and searched for man's meaning, you know, he sort of led that sort of thinking. Um, There's definitely something connected to that. I mean, on that point, what was your eureka moment? When did you move from being not necessarily a naysayer, but you weren't particularly, let's say, um, convinced that purpose was uh, empirically uh, generating, you know, business results to becoming a purpose-driven professor? How... What, what it happened to you personally? You know, several things. Uh, it's sort of like a intersection of a several set of things that happened to me. Um, you know, my students, uh, I was t- teaching and chairing our advanced management program. We had the Boston bombing uh, over here. The students got together. They did a whole kind of a fundraising for the victims of that tragedy. They raised, you know, $150,000 in like two days. And they had their own companies contribute. But this led to a larger conversation around like, what is the role of business in society? Yeah. And, and as we think about role of business society, you can ask that question naturally to the question of what is our purpose? Why are we here? And, and, and I was completely ill-equipped to answer this question. I was like, why are we having this conversation? You want to talk about CSR? Sure, let's talk about CSR. And every company should be doing CSR and doing... And I was working on a book on sustainability and I kind of sort of got it, but I hadn't stepped back to ask the existential question that this is perhaps a delivery system to get an organization to really engage with this community, with society, with thinking long-term value. The delivery system was through this concept called purpose. And then I started piecing it together. I then started looking at a bunch of small companies And I wrote an article called The Soul of a Startup because some of them would lament the loss of their youth, you know, like, oh my God, we've lost the old days, a lot of nostalgia. 
And I was asked, them, what did you lose? What's lost? Well, the informality, the casual culture, this, the, that. And it took me a while to get my head around the idea that they were talking about something else also. This purposeful orientation among the team that we are here to do something bigger, ambitious, change something in the world. And somehow that ambition, collective ambition and excitement around it gets lost. And then it just suddenly turns into, I'm, a, I'm doing a job. And, and I have to say to you, this is not a new idea. The genesis of this goes back actually to the early part of the 1900s. You know, there was a professor at actually Harvard Business School named Chester Barnard, who wrote a book called The Function of the Executive. And then in the 50s and 60s, there was another gentleman named Philip Selznick also talked about the role of the leader. And at that time, they were looking at this idea from the lens of what is a leader's job. And they said a leader's job is to infuse meaning into mm. what people are doing because your job is to energize people to want to work. And you got to infuse meaning into what they do because when you do that, they will engage in a way that is different. And they somehow got lost. We kind of got, went down this path of shareholder value. We started talking about other things. And a, a very core idea and work also. And now you see some really interesting work on job crafting and conversations about how there are people who will experience their work more as a calling than a job. And, and I, think there's a, I think we're at the cusp of something that is going to actually change in a, a lot of businesses. Mm. That's my hope. That's, I, I look forward to that. Um, one last question I have for you, you may not want to answer, but I know secretly you're working on a new book. I don't know if you want to mention kind of what you're thinking about. Yeah. So my book, uh, which is hopefully coming out uh, by the end of the early next year, uh, published by HarperCollins, and I'm really excited about it. It's taken me two years. I interviewed over 200 people. Uh, at over 20 companies, and it turned out to be both, I would say, inspiring and daunting. Mm. It was really inspiring to hear great stories of companies and how they have balanced an idealism with realism, how they've had to navigate trade-offs and choices, mm. how they've thought about this problem in their own, and tried, so that's the first part of it. It was really inspiring to hear their stories about how they've thought about this in really expansive ways. One of them being Anand Mahindra, Mahindra and Mahindra. But, you know, Josh Silverstein at Etsy. And I can go on and on about company after company. Uh, Viraj Puri at Gotham Green. Um, you know, Satya Nadella at Microsoft. So small and large companies. Um, but it was also daunting to hear how hard it is. As you said earlier, sometimes simple things can be really hard. <laughs> Absolutely. So my book is to design, I hope, to share the inspiring message, but also to unpack how this work they do can be daunting, but there are ways to understand and learn from them Ooh. and hopefully inspire others to follow. I love that. That balance of business idea with business idealism. Really brilliant. Um, well, for all of you who are participating today, I strongly recommend that you follow Ranji Gulati on LinkedIn and uh, keep your eyes open for his new book, which I'm sure will be an eye opener. Ranji, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a truly inspiring and illuminating session. Really fun to see you again. Thank you, Scott. Great to see you. And I wish all of you the very best. And uh, thanks again. Looking forward to continued conversations with you soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.
Good afternoon from the Purpose Power Summit 2021 here in New York City. We've had some incredible speakers. And don't forget, we have the results of the 2021 Purpose Power Index coming up later today. The Purpose Power Index, of course, is the world's largest empirical study of purpose-based brands with over 20,000 U.S. consumer responses. Find out a little later. Stay tuned for who the brand purpose winners are and those who didn't match up. There'll be a drum roll and you will, I think, be very surprised and inspired by who's going to make the shortlist and, of course, the ultimate winners. But before that, we've got some wonderful content coming your way. Next at the Purpose Power Summit, we've got Verizon Chairman and CEO Hans Vestberg. It might seem preposterous that one man can motivate 130,000 people in dozens of different roles, but with a well-crafted statement of purpose, a deep commitment by the C-suite, and one or two tricks, that's exactly what he's done, guaranteeing a more seamless digital world for the rest of us. Hans, thanks so much for being here with us today. Um, I, you came to Verizon, you became CEO, chairman, but you arrived with uh, already uh, an understanding of how important purpose was or is to businesses. Where did that come from? First of all, I mean, when you come into a new company, especially a company like Verizon that has been very successful, um, you, you start thinking about how do you bring your whole team with you. And uh, we, in the beginning, we made it very clear how to, uh, to articulate uh, sort of what we bring from the past, what has been great things and what, uh, what we want to do in the future. In that conversation, it became very important for us to rally around sort, I call it the, uh, the cultural operating system. That means that you have a purpose, uh, you have uh, values, uh, internal and external values, and you have leadership philosophies. That for me is the cultural system that's gonna support the, the strategy you have as a company. So it, for us, it became important very early on to define where we want, what we aspire for in the future. Uh, and that's where the, the purpose came from. And, and we built it around the four stakeholders as well. So we can actually, uh, everyone understands that we're serving four stakeholders, society, customers, employees, uh, and shareholders. Uh, and that, that was important. But I guess historically for me, I'm, I'm Swedish. I come from Sweden. Uh, worked a lot with value-based sort of organization, worked a lot in team sports, trying to find the purpose why we're there and how we fight together. And, and not only that, how we also do it together, meaning the values of the organization becomes equally important. So I think that was what I brought to Verizon when we started what we call the Verizon 2.0. Um, it's probably two and a half years uh, ago now. To be clear, uh, that value proposition is that uh, we create the networks that move the world forward. Um, succinct, un understandable, but Verizon has lots of businesses, 130,000 some odd employees, I believe. How, how do you uh, make sure everyone gets that message and, and carries it forward in what they do every day? We wanted it, first of all, to have a uh, 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 a clear purpose that everybody can remember and they can all relate to it. And uh, networks for us is what we do every day. It's physical networks or it's, uh, uh, it's people networks or networks of people. Uh, that's what we build every day, if either in uh, our brands of Verizon Media Group with our Yahoo and AOL, uh, which we now later on is going to divest, but anyhow, it was part of that. And the, and the networks and the, that we build around. So it was very important to relate that. So, but we also understood that that's very easy to do from the top down. So we actually, of course, had an employee movement uh, to really be part of this, uh, the journey on the purpose, the internal values, the external values. Uh, and we, we actually had a, an idea how to engage everyone. And we, we started with the purpose coin. We had a coin, uh, it's only 300 coins. Uh, we gave it to the top 300 first, and they needed to give it to someone within a couple of weeks that is actually living up to the purpose and the internal values. I, th I think it's important here actually to say that we're talking about a physical coin, right? Yeah, not, physical coin, <laughs> not, yeah. not a token. Not, not, not like this, yeah. It's a physical coin 
that we start to pass on in organizations when people were living up to the purpose, they were living up to our values. We have uh, core values in our company that we stand up for and we start passing up and we can follow it because we have the QR codes on it. So we can follow how these coins are moving around in our organization. And of course, it started high up. Now it's all across the globe, different units being passed along. And it was a way to see that we have an employee movement at the same time supporting the values of the company and the purpose of the company. That was just one thing. We did many other things, but that was concrete how we did it in the beginning to get everybody to be part of it. And, and so this actually originating in the C-suite, but I think I, I read a story the other day where uh, someone in retail, and I think this is one of the remarkable things about what you've done is that um, you've instilled purpose, uh, not just in the C-suite um, and, and not just in high level people, but 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 people who are, are are working poles and people who are in retail and in so many different places, right? But I think I just saw that someone in one of your retail outlets actually just got one one of the coins. Absolutely, no, no, it, it, the whole intention. I'm out visiting stores or field engineers. We know about somebody done a good, great job. You pass the coin. You pass it. Also, you, you need to make a written description why you give the coin to someone, why you believe they have been part of of the purpose and the values of the company, uh, uh, and so they know why they got it. And when they pass it along, they need to do the same. So you just imagine the subset of information we have and how these coins are moving around. They've been moving around for one and a half year right now in the company. And of course, it's a great pride to keep the coin. You can have it for a couple of weeks or a month. So, so of course, because you know you're part of the purpose and where we're going. So it, it was just one idea. We, we had many others. But for us, we wanted to be tangible, not only for the top leaders. We wanted it to be a purpose-driven company aiming for these four stakeholders with clear north stars for all our stakeholders. We have a five-year plan for our shareholders, for for employees, for our customers and society, what we want to do in all four of them, hanging together in what we call the Verizon 2.0. So when when you get this purpose, um, it it provides for you uh, guardrails, not only how how to act and how to engage with with stakeholders, um, but does it define where you go as a business? Yeah, it does define how, where we go with the business because if you think about the three pillars in, in every business you have, you, you have the purpose, which basically say why we exist and why we're here. And then you have the strategy, what we do, and then the culture, which basically tells you how we do it. And, and you know, that's for me the cultural system you need to have because you, you cannot live with one uh, out of the other. So that's why it defines definitely how we act because we have our values, core values, uh, in the company, we call it the credo, uh, how we deal with our, our, with our friends and colleagues, how we deal with customers, how we respect everyone, diversity. All this is super important also, uh, how you do it. And uh, that's the culture barrier that sets that up. And is it fair to say that it also tells you what businesses you shouldn't be in? I mean, does, does the purpose that you have actually, ha- has it led to, for example, recent divestitures? I haven't led to anything, but of course, when you think about the purpose, it has to cover everything we're doing every day and where each and every employee feel that I understand where we're going as a company. I'm a part of that purpose. Even though you might, uh, you know, I started my career, I started checking travel expenses. I, I always start with that example there. So, uh, so uh, even if you're checking travel expenses, you're checking travel expenses for somebody doing network uh, design or, or engineering. So you're part of creating the networks that the, the create the, the future. So uh, it, it's really much that everybody should feel that a part of that. What, what is the one thing that everyone who's here today listening to us right now, um, what, what, what do you think is most valuable for them to understand that once you uh, lock on to a purpose, how to make sure that it actually uh, gets continued on, right? I've been parts of lots of organizations that have had a lot of well-meaning uh, strategies that often uh, never go anywhere after they're first articulated. No, you're right. And, and, and that's why this holistic system becomes important. And you, you need to be uh, perseverant and, and you need to actually do it for a long time. So people understand the pillars that you have in this system. Of course, the purpose is the overall guiding place you're going to, but you have a strategy supporting that. And then, of course, you have the culture around it. And it, the only way I would say in today's world, you know, where uh, you have so many stakeholders, you have so many uh, 
uh, so diverse employee base, customer base, you need to have this intact because that leads you in decision making. It leads you how you act. It leads you how, how, how to do things. I mean, I can take one, one example. When we started, or uh, the co when the COVID started, which of course was horrible and hit uh, our employees and friends and customers, just horrible. Um, we always said that we don't compromise between the stakeholders. We have the employees, customers, shareholders, and the society. In that moment, we basically, we said that, no, we're going to change. We're going to set an agenda every morning when we meet, we start talking about the safety and health of our employees. That's number one priority. Number two, we keep the networks up for our customers because it's more important than ever right now. And then, of course, we need to do right for our society in these times, as well as for our shareholders. But the priority was different. And that was coming from our work in Verizon 2.0, that we had that framework. We knew where we could also change it because of circumstances that we actually could never expect or uh, see happening. And you feel that that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't had uh, such a strong purpose. That, like This no. is an example, a real world example of how having that purpose can guide you in unusual circumstances. Absolutely. The framework helped us in that moment to see clearly how we want to operate uh, and how we prioritize our decision making, our actions, our resources. That was clear, uh, very clear from that part. So we, I, I would say we were lucky. We at least had one, uh, more than one year since we launched Verizon 2.0 when we came in uh, to this uh, moment of the COVID-19 beginning of middle of 2020. Just, just getting back to uh, the coin for one second, I think it was Alan Mulally who would have a, a printed business card with sort of his commandments uh, on them that he'd hand out to everybody so the whole team would remember. You had a coin and, and that sort of circulates in, in uh, a rare fashion, making it even more yeah. valuable than a business card. Do you, you think that that actual, that, that physical uh, item actually helped people? And do you, do you think this is something we should all think about when we're developing our purpose, that, that there's something tactile that actually helps us keep in our head what we're thinking about? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you need an employee movement that they feel equally committed and part of the purpose and understand why we're here and how we're acting and how we're doing things. That's extremely important to have the top team knowing and remembering the, uh, the, the purpose is not good enough. We need to have all of that. And that's also why we measure our employees much more frequent than, than we've ever done before to see that. Do you understand why you're here? Is your managing, supporting you? Do you understand the purpose of the company? You need to measure it all the time as well to see that you're staying current and you, you have a connection with the whole organization. And of course, Verizon is a large organization. As I said in the beginning, there's 130 plus thousand employees uh, in very diverse places uh, and very diverse backgrounds. You need to see that you actually keep it together with something. And that's where the, the sort of the, uh, the, the big sort of overseeing of a cultural operating system with a purpose, internal, external values and leadership philosophies is, is, is putting a sort of a, a frame around our strategy, how we operate. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think that, um, uh, you know, I, I understand that in some respects you're, you're, you're coming from top down, but you also have to activate, you know, the middle and, and, and the bottom. And, and what goes into that? So uh, when we launched this Verizon 2.0, we came up also with six, uh, uh, seven different leadership philosophies. Uh, and we decided to train all the leaders in the company, that is more than 15,000. Uh, actually, what does it mean? How do you act? Because not, not all leaders are the same, but the principles are the same what is important in the leadership. So we train first all leaders in the organization, and then we trained all the employees. All employees had a chance to understand what are the leadership philosophies, how does it hang together with the purpose, uh, and all of that. So basically, we, we trained the 100, we were 150,000 when we were doing it, uh, basically employees, uh, when we did that training, in order to see that everybody understood and had the conversation about it, purpose, leadership philosophies, and how we do it. And then, of course, you measure at the same time. So you see that you move the whole movement in the right direction constantly. And of course, there are mishaps and uh, things that you need to correct all the time, but that's how we've done it. And we are uh, some two and a half years into it, and it's far away from finished. You have much more to do, but we have the framework there. So how do you go forward now? What, what happens next? How do you not lose traction? 
I think that uh, uh, for me is that you have you, you put equally much focus on all the stakeholders in every meeting, in every gathering, in every strategy. That's how I learned that uh, you, you don't lose focus. I mean, it's very easy to be super focused only on customers for a while or, uh, or, or employees only. But, you know, it is the things hanging together. And I think that's what uh, we try to do all the time. And that's why we have short-term goals for all the stakeholders and we have long-term goals and we have metrics to, to see that we're meeting them and, and that means also that we, we will see that uh, we talk about them, we have them in meetings, we discuss them and that's how you keep it up and then you see the organization and following and understanding it better. And, and whether they're short-term or, or long-term uh, goals, they're all um, uh, guided by the philosophy of, 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 of creating the network. Um, yeah, that, that moves us all forward. Yeah, absolutely. That's the basis is that we, we create the networks that move the world forward. That, that's sort of the basis of everything we're doing. Uh, and uh, But ultimately, uh, the whole value system around it becomes equally important, how we act and how we, how we do that. And, uh, and then, of course, our employees feel that I'm part of it. And, and that's the, the movement we call internal. And we are more, I, mean, I think, during the, the pandemic, we also decided to be much more closer to our employee base. And we, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, we understood that we have so many layers in the company, given the size. And with so many changes and so much risk involved for our for our customers and employees, we decided basically to to host a thirty minute uh, live show every lunch. We started in the beginning of March last year. We ran it at least for eight, six, seven months, where I was on every day for thirty minutes talking to all the employees. Uh, nowadays, they only invite me every second week or something like that. But it was also a way to connect the purpose, what we're doing, and what was the priorities based on that uh, to communicate. And some days we didn't have much to say, of course. And we, of course, you want to say what we're doing and uh, be safe and uh, be careful and all of that. Or call this number if you have a problem. And, and I think that also connected us even closer to an employee movement. We had days with over 100,000 people looking at the TV show we had, uh, which is, of course, enormous in an employee engagement or movement. Yeah, astonishing. Uh, such great insight, um, Hans Vesberg. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. We hope you're having a great morning here at the Purpose Power Summit 2021. We've already heard good discussion between purpose-driven leaders, but there's much more coming up. Stay tuned to hear my conversation with Ariana Huffington on the necessity of employee well-being. To catch a glimpse at the deeper motivation behind seventh generation's purpose-oriented initiatives, and to learn about Zoom and its transformative journey over the past year. And those are just a few of the highlights. There's a lot more, and here's what's in store.
It took enormous success and the exhaustion and ultimately injuries from that exhaustion to open Ariana Huffington's eyes to the importance of wellness, to realize we not only need sleep and calm to get by, but to thrive. And in fact, as founder and CEO of Thrive Global, she takes that message to others, helping CEOs and CHROs of Fortune 500 companies extend their own purpose by extending employee well-being, a metric that's never been more important. Ariana, thank you very much for coming to the Purpose Power Summit today. Thank you, Scott. Great to be with you. Um, I had just talked to Hans Vestberg, who I know you've worked with, and he talked about his four stakeholders. And uh, uh, you actually just deal with one of them in some respects, and, and that's the employee and how important it is to sort of uh, create purpose and, and well-being around employees. Uh, what was your insight that this should be uh, your next foray in your, your life of entrepreneurship? Well, actually, Scott, it started with a painful wake-up call two years into building the Huffington Post, the divorced mother of two daughters, when I collapsed from exhaustion and burnout, hit my um, head on my desk, broke my cheekbone. And that was the beginning of this journey to um, study and understand that burnout was not just my personal problem, but a global epidemic. So I started covering all these issues at the Huffington Post exhaustively. But by 2016, I realized that I didn't want just to raise awareness, which of course I could have continued doing through a media company. I wanted to help people change behavior, help them go from awareness to action. Because by 2016, and even more so now, we kind of know what we need to be doing around sleep or food or movement or the thoughts we hold in our head, but behavior change is incredibly hard. Mm. So I wanted to uh, launch a behavior change product company that through technology uh, could help people take these micro steps, these daily small incremental steps. Um, that could lead to healthier habits and a more productive, purpose-driven and, and um, healthier life. How, how did we get to the place uh, where, uh, one, we did not recognize this for so long, uh, yet now that we have, um, businesses feel as responsible uh, for, for helping as individuals do? Well, Scott, as you know, the pandemic has been a huge accelerant. Sure. The truth is that even before the pandemic, we had a terrible mental health crisis with skyrocketing um, increases in chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension, which are stress-related, lifestyle-driven. We had the World Health Organization two years ago acknowledge burnout as an occupational hazard, but it took the pandemic to get the attention of the C-suite, of boards. This is no longer just an HR issue. Um, we are launching Thrive in many companies with the CEOs present, like at Accenture with Julie Sweet, at Pfizer with Albert Bourla. That would not have happened pre-pandemic. What has happened now is that um, CEOs, um, CFOs, boards, have seen the connection between well-being and productivity and business metrics. So this is no longer a kind of warm and fuzzy HR benefit. Um, it truly is essential for a healthy bottom line. Yeah. And yeah. even as you know, Scott, the SEC um, has issued this groundbreaking uh, new reporting requirement for companies to report what they are doing for their human capital around recruitment, attrition, development. That had never happened before. All they had asked before about human capital was how many people do you employ? That's right, right. Uh, and it didn't matter <laughs> whether they were zombies or not, basically. I mean, I think this is a really uh, interesting point and, and probably rests in this statistic, which you've, you've talked about. And, and it's how uh, in, in the 70s and in decades prior, presumably, uh, 
80 some odd percent of a business's value existed in its physical capital, in, in, in buildings, in, in inventory, in, in, in products. Today, that valuation is completely flipped and it's the human capital that has the 80% value and the hard goods that have uh, the 20% the value. Um, that's remarkable. It is remarkable. And the fact that we can make a real difference uh, to how um, employees show up at work is what is driving a, a, a lot of these offerings. We find, for example, with our product that uh, we need to be there continuously as a coach in your pocket to help you around all the things that increase your health and productivity, whether it's sleep, food, movement, gratitude, financial stress. But also what we find, Scott, really moves the needle is real time uh, stress interventions. Because the truth is that stress is unavoidable. You know, nobody can sit here and promise a stress-free existence, uh, but cumulative stress is avoidable. So we've launched in our app, and we're about to launch it next week within Zoom and WebEx, a 60-second reset feature based on the latest neuroscience that it takes 60 to 90 seconds to course correct from stress. It's actually an incredible finding. Uh, that in 60 to 90 seconds, you can release the cortisol hormone from your body, move to the parasympathetic nervous system out of fight or flight. And so the app and within Zoom or WebEx, you can download it and have preloaded resets around breathing or stretching or reframing your problems or remembering what you are grateful for. And it's kind of amazing that the small interventions reconnected with um, more resilient, um, more unflappable part of ourselves, we call it the eye of the hurricane, and that makes a huge difference to how we show up at work and in the rest of our lives. I think it's a fascinating thing that um, we need these tools, we need the micro steps, even though uh, we somehow know better. Presumably you knew better um, that you were exhausting yourself before you had your incident. Why is it so hard for us to actually take those steps on our own? Why do we need uh, help like you provide? Well, Scott, that's an amazing question uh, because human beings, unfortunately, um, are are not so easily moved to do what is right. You know, we need a catalyst. My catalyst was a broken cheekbone. Sometimes the catalysts are much worse. You know, it could be a um, heart attack, um, um, an event um, where that has catastrophic consequences. And even, you know, we talk to people, we even after a heart attack, after they say, I had this heart attack, I'm going to change my life, I'm not going to be living so breathlessly and frenetically, and six months later, they're back to how they were. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's imperative to have, like, continuous support and break it down into micro steps rather than big new year resolutions like I'm going to work out in the gym for an hour a day and then three weeks later you've abandoned it and it's harder to get back on the wagon. So we believe this continuous, uh, daily, small, we call our micro steps too small to fail uh, interventions um, is what makes the difference and leads to healthier habits. Um, I can give you my two favorite micro steps if you want, Scott. I would, I would love it. I would love it. I, I did not get any sleep last night. I'm stressed today. I would love that. Okay. Why didn't you get any sleep? I don't know. You know, I was just tossing and turning. I can't say for okay. sure. Okay. Well, we have a lot of solutions for that. We've, uh, <laughs> um, we launched a podcast called Meditative Story yep. that is really storytelling. Like you... You have an adorable son, Luca. I bet when he was little, you didn't just drop him in bed. You read him a story. You sang him a lullaby. Well, human beings, when they get older, need a transition too. So I recommend meditative story. We also worked with Audible. 
and launched a series of sleep solutions, sleep meditations. My favorite that always puts me to sleep when I'm stressed is by Sean Combs, Didi. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, <laughs> um, doing this beautiful sleep meditation. So my two favorite micro steps are how you end your day and how you start your day. So I'm sure you, like most people listening today, don't have an end to their working day. You could stay up all night handling things. So if you're going to be able to get a good night's sleep and not toss and turn, you need to declare an end to your working day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mark this declaration <laughs> through a ritual, which is turning off this thing, this phone, and charging it outside my bedroom. I know that sounds like maybe a huge micro step. So start with one night a week if you are not ready to do it every night. And you'll see the difference when you really put some distance between yourself and this repository of every yes. problem and every project you are dealing with. Yeah, you don't want to sleep right next to the thing that is creating the most anxiety in the world for you, do you? And, we, yeah, and yet we do. Or distractions. And sometimes I know from myself, um, you can say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it on my nightstand. But if I wake up in the middle of the night, I won't look at it. But you do look you at do. it. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And what about the morning micro step? So the morning micro step is much, much easier if your phone is not next to you. But even if you're not ready to abandon your phone for the night, start your day with 60 seconds before you go to your phone. 60 seconds. I'm not saying start your day with 20 minutes meditation, just 60 seconds to set your intention for the day before you go to your phone, which is what the world wants of you. What do you want from your day? Or to remember what you're grateful for, or to just simply take some conscious deep inhales and exhales, anything, except going immediately to your phone before you're fully conscious, before your feet have hit the ground. Two simple micro steps. Uh, but they make a big difference in terms of bookending your day. There are hundreds of micro steps, but these two happen to be my favorites. I, I think they're great. And I, I know I can imagine myself picturing myself right now, launching out of bed, grabbing for the phone that is my alarm at the same time, turning it off as I'm stumbling into the day and taking that time actually uh, <laughs> would be a rather pleasant start instead, wouldn't it? I, I wanted to say that, um, uh, you know, it, it, as you pointed out earlier, that, that this is there's a lot of science that backs this up, and now there are a lot of large companies uh, that that are are paying attention. You've worked with uh, Walmart and Microsoft and and uh, Hilton and J.P. Morgan. Uh, what did it take? I mean, was it really a balance sheet look to 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 motivate those large companies? And how should smaller companies, right? We're not all Fortune 500s. How should smaller companies think about implementing some of what you're talking about when they're not as resource rich, say? Well, whether you're a tiny company of three people or um, a huge company with 1.8 million employees like, um, like Walmart, these are necessary tools because if your employees are stressed out, anxious, depressed, doesn't matter how many productivity enhancements and uh, optimized workflows you give them, they are not going to be able to perform at their best. And I think it's this connection between performance and well-being that is making companies of any size uh, prioritize the well-being and mental health of their employees. And recognizing, especially as we are talking a lot, Scott, about more diverse and inclusive workplaces, that when you're burnt out, when you're running on empty, it's very hard to be empathetic and uh, bring out the best in you. And without that, it's very hard to create cultures of belonging, which are essential for an inclusive and diverse community. 
I, I think that's right, and that, that's something I, I can uh, recognize in, in myself, certainly. Um, and I think it's incumbent on, upon all of us a little bit to, to do that examination and see what role we play in that and how we can make uh, lives better for the people who work for us and in turn make their contributions more significant. And you know, Scott, what makes a big difference is all of us sharing our journey. Like if you decide to practice one of these micro steps, like starting your day with the 60 seconds, please write about it. Write about it for Inc. We would love to amplify it on Thrive, on our social media. You have no idea how much of a difference storytelling makes. Um, our app is full of stories as well as science-backed micro steps. Uh, let's say if we are working with PNG employees, they're going to see stories from their leaders, their peers of what they're doing. And that gives them cultural permission as well as inspiration um, to set off on this journey. So we would recommend then everyone who's listening here today uh, to go to Thrive Global and, and see what's on offer there, correct? Right, but also to, to share their story um, for Inc., for Thrive Global, for everywhere. At uh, Thrive, we say ubiquity is the new exclusivity. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want anything exclusively. We just want these messages uh, everywhere because we are in the middle of a cultural transformation and um, and anything we can do to accelerate it will make a huge difference uh, in our lives in the lives of our businesses and uh, society at large ariana huffington important words thank you so much for being with us today thank you so much scott What a great morning. And here's what's coming up next. Welcome back. We're excited to have you here with us at the 2021 Purpose Power Summit. I'm Chip Walker, Head of Strategy at Strawberry Frog. Um, there's going to be a ton of fantastic back-to-back -back content coming up all afternoon. But up next specifically, I'm super excited to be having a conversation with Stephen Hahn Griffiths, who's uh, Executive Vice President uh, with the well-known research firm called RepTrack. Uh, together, Stephen and I are going to be sharing out the results of the 2021 Purpose Power Index over the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, so Stephen, welcome and thanks so much for being here. Hey Chip, always great to partner with you and the team at Strawberry Frog as ever. What I'm going to walk through is some of the key learnings from a most recent study and fundamentally how the pandemic changed brand purpose as we know it. What's amazing about our work together, I believe, is it's the first empirically proven model on measuring corporate brand purpose and brand purpose more specifically. It's really a sort of parallel to the initial study we fielded in 2019, of course, more recently, 
post the pandemic, there are real implications for some of the things we've learned. And we talked to a lot of people. We talked to over 6,500 individual respondents, which provides a nationally representative sample of the US population. We captured nearly 21,000 individual ratings across 200 individual brand entities. And the timing of the study, just as a point of reference, was January 2021. So this is literally fresh out of the field. But let's just quickly ground ourselves on what we captured. We captured what we're calling the Purpose Power Index and the four components to measuring this algorithm. First off, your perceptions of the company based on its ability to de deliver beyond profits. In other words, does the organization stand for more than just making money? Are you committed to improving lives and serving the communities in which you exist? Do you sort of deliver on the fulfillment of the embeddement of society? Not just benefiting those stakeholders close in, such as employees, customers, or shareholders, but society as a whole. And then finally, the fourth pillar fundamentally, are you committed to making the world a better place to live? Beyond humanity, are you committed to the uh, biodiversity of the world at, at large? So these are the core things we capture as measuring corporate brand purpose and brand purpose more specifically. And what an amazing uh, contrast from where we were in 2019 to 2021. Of course, we've all been through the uh, trials and tribulations of the pandemic, but equally, it's had significant implications for the way that brands are viewed in terms of uh, purpose. First off, I'd like to report that even in the eye of the crisis, purpose matters. Indeed, it's probably fair to say that since the uh, end, end of COVID, hopefully, uh, as, as we see it today, Reputation and purpose have become more inextricably linked. So the R squared, in other words, its statistical significance has only increased from 0.75 to where it was in 2019 to a 0.88. In other words, the integrity of purpose matters more than ever before, and it has a bigger impact on the overall reputation of your organization. What's fascinating amongst all the different brand entities we measured, and just as a point of reference, I said there was over 200 entities. Of those that made the top 100, nearly one third of those brands are, are new. So there's real moving and shaking going on within the context of how brands are viewed. And importantly, amongst those in the top 20, um, over 50% are new. So we're seeing a lot of companies rise and fall through the lens of corporate brand purpose. Here's a recap of what we presented to the world in 2019. There were brands that dominated, fundamentally those strongly associated with the premise of being socially good. Companies like Seventh Generation, Tom's, Method, REI, Wegmans, to name a few. Well, those are kind of rose to the top and really kind of represented companies who were purposeful through the lens of being socially good. Fast forward to most recent study findings in 2021, what we see is a new crop of new, more diverse types of purposeful leaders emerge. Those companies who are not just socially good, but essentially good in many different ways. New entrants, including the likes of SpaceX, GSK, Abvi, Kimberly Clark, 3M, Tesla, to name a few. All companies who've emerged and risen through the lens of being purposeful, but aren't necessarily companies born out of purpose. These are many companies who have sort of evolved more purposefully and found a new way to be relevant as society's changed around them. Also important to mention, there are those companies that may not rank at the top of the hierarchy, but are certainly work in progress as what we consider being breakaway brands. In other words, they differentiate as being purposeful and standing out in the category in which they play. So Whole Foods relative to the overarching retail, Danone relative to other consumer packaged goods and food and beverage brands, Microsoft and the Linda Technology, UPS, Chick-fil-A, Truist, LinkedIn, all companies of growing emergence in terms of purpose that we would certainly have on our watch list as being breakaway brands that are really fulfilling the broader agenda of purpose and really starting to stand out in the category in which they play. But with the more context and more detail, let me hand you back to Chip to take you through some of the real underlying stories to reveal those purposeful companies and maybe how and why they got there. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, let's let's go in now and uh, go into a little bit more depth about uh, the top 20 winners for 2021. Uh, I just want to highlight some of them. And, and uh, what I want to point out is really the diversity that Stephen uh, mentioned. It's a much more diverse list of companies than we had in 2019. Uh, to start out with, we had uh, a couple of uh, real, to me, surprises that popped up in the list that, that were really not necessarily uh, social good companies necessarily. Uh, 
uh, in a lot of people's perception, but uh, actually were bold innovators. And specifically, I'm talking about Elon Musk's two companies, SpaceX and Tesla. SpaceX was not, e we, did, we didn't even have it on our list in 2019. It bar barely was there. Uh, 2021, it was the number three brand. Tesla went from number 22 to number nine in terms of its purpose perception. So I think uh, everyone probably knows a lot about both SpaceX and, and Tesla. Uh, and the fact that uh, Elon Musk seems to be on a mission uh, to put us into outer space and to uh, make uh, sustainability more, more common. So bold innovators were on the list in a way they weren't before. Here is another big surprise, is that we had some brands, in fact, some entire industries that went uh, from sort of zero to hero over the course of uh, 2019 going into 2021. Big Pharma in particular, you know, category not only not necessarily viewed as purposeful, but I think who some people would have kind of viewed as a villain, uh, almost anti-purposeful in the past, went from uh, almost at the bottom of all the industries we looked at to being the number one industry. Uh, and, and I guess we can all uh, imagine why. Uh, we look at a couple of the, the brands uh, from Big Pharma. Uh, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline performed fantastic. They went from being number 160 out of 200 in 2019 to number four overall in 2021. And of course, they were in the news all year. They, they actually didn't end up coming out with a vaccine. Uh, it was delayed, but they were in the news talking about it probably more than any other brand, e even Pfizer. We see Pfizer over on the, uh, the right-hand side. They were probably the most improved brand in the study. They were starting at a lower number, number 188 in 2019, but they uh, came all the way up and cracked the top uh, 50 at number 49 in 2021. So we all know they uh, kind of performed a miracle in uh, pulling off a vaccine in, in record time. We also saw some kind of practical uh, brands that uh, while maybe relied on in our households, I don't know if anybody saw as too purposeful, uh, just as there were sort of essential workers who came to the fore during the pandemic. So uh, we, we have some sort of essential brands here. Clorox being a biggie, uh, another company that I think in the past maybe was associated with um, you know, chemicals and, and uh, had, had maybe had sometimes had some negatives associated with it, was seen in a really different light. They're all the way up at number 11 on the Purpose Power Index. As we know, they went way out of their way to provide products, to, to donate uh, uh, in, 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 in a way that um, you know, was really uh, needed during the pandemic. Uh, 3M really uh, was heroic in their efforts to make masks uh, throughout the pandemic. Kimberly Clark, as we all know, there was a huge rush on one of their top uh, products, toilet paper, but, uh, but other essential household products as well. Again, moving uh, well up the list um, uh, at number six from number 20 uh, two years before. I think another thing is interesting to point out is the size of the companies uh, at the top of our list. In 2019, of the top um, 10 companies on our list, uh, only one of them was a gigantic corporation. And by gigantic, we're saying, say, $10 billion plus in revenue. Um, and uh, that was uh, USAA in 2019. In 2021, of our top 10 companies, 8 out of 10 are gigantic companies, 10, 10 billion plus in revenue. And I think that just goes to bust the myth that it's really kind of only smaller, uh, purpose-born startup types that can be seen as purposeful. Giants actually can, can do so and uh, do so more than others. To just sort of dimensionalize this point a little bit more that purpose has broadened way beyond social good. Uh, higher purpose obviously involves social good, but uh, we created perceptual map. Uh, this is based on real data from the study where we had um, respondents rate all the brands on a bunch of different attributes. Things like uh, selling products that make everyday life better, things like not being afraid to be bold or controversial, uh, acting uh, innovatively to create new solutions to advance mankind. So there are about 20 or 21 of these that they rated all the brands on. And then we uh, statistically mapped them out in 2D space, and uh, this is basically what you see. And the reason uh, we were showing you this is that you see socially conscious is uh, one of the axes over on the right, uh, and there are a bunch of brands that kind of are, are, are over on that side. But there are other axes, too. At the opposite end, there's innovation. And then at the top, you have practical versus bold. So you can see that there's almost sort of four quadrants, sort of practical and socially conscious brands like Lego and Etsy. 
Uh, down on the bottom, you have socially conscious brands that are more bold, like Patagonia, which we'll look at in a few minutes, or Ben & Jerry's. These are brands that tend to be a bit more in your face about their uh, social activism. But over on the left-hand side, innovative companies, some that are bold, like Tesla and SpaceX, but up on top, you see some that are innovative in a more practical way, like the uh, essential brands we just looked at, like 3M, Clorox, uh, etc. All of this is to say is that uh, a change that we saw is that there's, there's not one way to be a higher purpose brand. There are multiple ways, uh, and some that are surprising, uh, like uh, innovation. So with that, let's turn uh, and look a little bit different. How do you become one of these brands that's recognized as, um, as having a higher purpose? Uh, what are the paths to get there? And I think what we did was we uncovered that there are five important ones. So again, uh, let, let me explain what we did. Uh, I won't go into a ton of detail, but as I mentioned, we had folks rate all the brands on over 20 purpose-related attributes, things about the products they make, uh, how innovative they are, how they treat their employees, philanthropy, uh, participation in uh, societal movements, uh, etc. Uh, we then did statistical analysis, which uh, told us two things. One, it broke them down into five underlying drivers of purpose perception, and it also told us how important these five drivers are in order. So that's what I want to share with you now. We're calling these the five P's of purpose activation. And you see going left to right that you go from um, important to even more important over on the right. Everything on here is important, but as you go right, things are more important. So the first one is about really products, products and services. So it may be surprising to folks that the most important thing, uh, if you want to be purposeful, is to make sure that you do things like having products and services that make everyday life better and positively contribute to society hugely important to purpose perception. Planet, making products and services sustainably and environmentally responsible operations. Progress is an interesting one that uh, I don't know if I would have expected to pop, but basically it's, a, it's about actively innovating solutions that advance mankind. And as we saw earlier, brands like SpaceX and Tesla really go off the chart on, uh, on that one. People, how are you treating folks as a, as a company or a corporation? Your employees, folks in your community, uh, what kind of philanthropy are you doing? And then the last one we're calling positive change. And it's really kind of two things. One is about sort of social justice, like support for things like equality, as well as social activism, uh, participating or supporting social movements and having a CEO who uh, speaks out on important issues. So it's sort of a social activism there. It's important, but interestingly, it is not the most important thing. So let's look a little bit at some companies who did well on each of these. Let's start with our number five driver, the one that I just got through talking about, positive change. It's really kind of social activism. Uh, a company that was off the charts on this one is Patagonia. And uh, you all may be familiar with uh, their campaign that was called uh, Vote the Assholes Out. Uh, Patagonia's purpose is, uh, and this is a direct quote, we're in the business to save our home planet. Uh, but the way that they do it is very in your face. Uh, this was a campaign to try to vote out folks, uh, po politicians who are climate deniers, and they, they put it in the tag of some of their men's clothing during 2020. So off the charts on that positive change driver. Another driver uh, is uh, people uh, that I talked about before. How are you treating folks, your consumers, your customers, your employees, your communities? Chick-fil-A was a real standout on this one. We're calling this sort of a warm meal with a side of humanity. You see a quote uh, uh, on the right-hand side here by Chuck Bullard, who is a VP at, um, at Chick-fil-A. If you want to change the world, start with a person three feet away. And if you've ever been to a Chick-fil-A, you know that they take hospitality and the way they treat folks uh, seriously. Uh, and it was recognized in the scores on uh, the Purpose Power Index this year. The progress driver, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, it was hard not to want to look at SpaceX uh, sort of changing the world. SpaceX's stated purpose is making humanity multiplanetary, and uh, gosh, it looks like they're doing it. Uh, during a year of sort of stagnation, SpaceX reminded us that our, our core, America, is about progress. Uh, they actually even named one of their spacecrafts uh, Resilience. So uh, a lot in the news this year, and people took notice. 
Second to last driver, Planet. I guess this one's not surprising, uh, but uh, Lego was uh, a brand that seems to have gone from, be going from plastic to anything but. Uh, their purpose is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. Uh, but uh, I think it's important to point out that Lego has made pledges that all their packaging is going to be made renewable by 2025. And uh, in fact, all of their core products are going to be from su sustainable materials by 2030. So a huge commitment to, to Planet on the part of Lego. And again, people are taking notice. The last one in our most important driver product, changing the world one product at a time. And uh, this was a surprise uh, because it's Unilever, which is kind of a, um, you know, an umbrella a corporation for brands that a lot of people know, like Dove and um, some other brands. Um, and often uh, the, the parent companies aren't known as well. But uh, Unilever's uh, long-term commitment to environment and sustainability got it noticed for the kinds of products it's making and things it's doing to make its products more sustainable. So you can see here on the right-hand right side, side from Fast Company, uh, one of their global brands, Omo, now you can wash your clothes with recycled carbon emissions. So um, Unilever not only making a difference, but getting um, credit for it. So just a couple of uh, other things uh, before maybe we have a little bit more conversation about uh, the study in general and purpose, but um, what do you do to actually be seen as a purpose leader? How do you use those, um, those different drivers that we just gotten through talk about and avoid being seen as a purpose washer? So there's actually four things that we've seen in working with companies and with this data over the past year. Um, claiming to be a purpose-driven company but ignoring these principles can have you end up being seen, I think, as disingenuous, uh, as not being uh, straightforward about it, as, as having ulterior motives, and being what we call a quote-unquote purpose washer. The first one is clarity. This may seem obvious, but um, it, it's something that I think uh, a lot of companies end up forgetting. If people don't understand what your company's purpose is, or at least have a general understanding of it, um, you're, you're sort of nowhere. Uh, a huge difference in the top 20 brands and all the other brands was that people said in our survey, I understand what this company's purpose is all about. So that's a biggie. Two, and again, you may think this is obvious, but uh, apparently it's not because it's action. And uh, of our top brands, what people told us uh, repeatedly was that they saw the brands do things. They saw them do communications. They saw them do actions that were bold, that they got the sense that they were unafraid to take a stand. So having a clear purpose but not acting on it is a problem. Uh, action is a key to, to getting it right. The third is that uh, of the stands people are taking, the companies that were at the top of our list, the stand they're taking tends to come across as being more of a societal stand not just a stand about, say, making a better product or a stand about um, doing better than uh, other folks in the category. These were actually stands that brands are taking on societal issues, whether it be the environment, whether it be uh, getting uh, us, our society into space again, um, a societal stand as opposed to something that's just more about everyday life. And the last one uh, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Uh, we call it story. And what that's all about is really the five drivers that we just got through looking at. Um, I think there's sometimes a tendency for a company to want to hit on one of them and just do that. Uh, let's say it's sort of more about um, positive change and social activism. So align with a cause um, and uh, or a movement in society that's out there, post about it on social media, um, and that's it. Uh, there's a problem with that. And what the problem is, is that purpose isn't just a why statement or a single action uh, to consumers in, in their mind. Purpose is a story in their minds. It's a narrative in their minds about how your entire company uh, operates, how it acts, how it lives in the world, and everything you do matters. So if you're doing social posts about um, a, uh, uh, let's say, a, an a equality issue, but consumers know that your company hasn't paid income tax in the past 10 years, uh, that you don't have a very diverse board of directors, that you uh, have a terrible environmental record, 
they, they notice this and they uh, fail to give you credit as a purpose-driven company because they see holes in your story. You come across as disingenuous. Uh, let me give you an example, and this is actually our top brand, seventh generation, of a brand that's hitting on all five of the P's uh, like gangbusters. Product, you see, and I think we all know uh, seventh generation's products are um, uh, uh, sort of uh, the gold standard in, in sustainability. A lot that they do in terms of planet, uh, smaller, 100% biodegradable packaging. They do a ton of innovation to do things like tackle stains. They uh, are known as a great place to work and for how they treat people in their communities. I'm looking forward to interviewing the CMO of Seventh Generation about all the things that they're planning to do differently in 2021 to be seen as more purposeful. So with that, that's sort of the story that we have for you. Um, so I sort of took a step back and uh, uh, talked with Stephen about it too to sort of think, so what are, what are some of the important things we learned about purpose in 2021? There are a ton of them, uh, as you just have sort of heard, but there were four that struck me particularly. Um, one, we talked about uh, that there's just a broader purpose landscape today. Um, there are more ways that people are giving brands credit for being purposeful. It's not just limited to a few smaller social good brands. Uh, really, it's open to any brand, depending on how they handle it. Um, Products proved to be massively important uh, in, in a way that I think maybe nobody expected. And obviously the pandemic had a lot to do with that, helping brands like Clorox be seen as a lot more purposeful than they were before. But innovation gave us hope. Again, not to beat a dead horse, but uh, SpaceX and uh, Tesla are great examples of that. But I think the, the thing that uh, to keep in mind as we move forward is that, um, you know, purpose perception apparently can shift super quickly. If you've ever been to brand tracking presentations where you're getting uh, year to year or month to month um, tracking results on how your brand is doing in the marketplace, one of the things that you probably know is that those metrics like things like relevance and uh, esteem, uh, even awareness, they don't change usually very fast at all. Um, they change very slowly year to year. And I think what we saw with this study is that purpose apparently is really culturally sensitive. And so where you are this year could be very, very different from where you are next year, depending on what you've been doing and what's been happening out there in culture, which again, I think uh, just underscores the importance of doing this purpose power research uh, every year. So that's uh, our presentation for, for today. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Stephen, um, you know, I was just uh, talking about my observations of some of the things that I found to be either most interesting or surprising or noteworthy coming out of the study. I don't know, did, did you agree with those? Did you have some other ones that uh, struck you? I did, Chip, and really fascinating subject. I feel like we could talk about this all day, but really, to your point about how purpose shifts quickly, I think it's fair to say that coming out of COVID, one of the things we've done as a society is we put companies on a higher moral pedestal. We've made it uh, sort of loftier and, and, and we've created higher expectations for what we expect a brand to deliver. Um, but what I thought was fascinating as a point of contrast to that is how the dependence and importance of products as a sort of grounding mechanism for purposes has become critically important. You can't lose yourself in the esoterics of higher purpose. It can't just be a statement that resides on the wall of the boardroom or in an annual report you really got to find a way to identify with the movement and find a way to activate it in a very tangible, genuine, authentic way. So as much as the North Star and the endeavor of how you want to fulfill purpose may not change radically, how you activate purpose and how you meet those changing expectations and the tectonic shifts that happen in society unto itself makes your management of a purpose almost a 365 day a year full contact sport in how do you continue to maintain the degree of purpose, how you activate it in a compelling way, how do you maintain the authenticity in, in meeting expectations. Um, not an easy endeavor, but truly, as we pointed out, there are great brands who know how to do it, so it's certainly possible in, in that realm. Fantastic. Could not agree more, Stephen. Um, so thank you. And uh, if uh, any of you out there would like a copy of today's presentation, you can download it on the, uh, the event website, which is uh, www.purposepowerindex.com. That's purposepowerindex.com. 
And with that, Stephen, I'd like to thank you so much for being here. As always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Chip. I enjoyed our conversation and all the very best to you. enjoying these panels as much as I am. And there's more to come. Here's what's next. Again, I'm Chip Walker, Head of Strategy at Strawberry Frog. Uh, we want to thank you for being part of the 2021 Purpose Power Summit. Coming up, we're going to have a lot more phenomenal panels for you, a lot of fascinating conversations about purpose. Uh, and speaking of which, up next, I'm super excited to have a conversation with none other than Hanukkah Willenborg. She is the CMO at Seventh Generation. Uh, this is a brand uh, where, that, when it comes to purpose, it, it's a brand whose reputation precedes it. So, Hanukkah, welcome, and uh, I'd like to thank you much, so much for being here. Thank you. Happy to be here, Chip. Great, great. Well, why don't we just go ahead and jump in? Um, so, Hanukkah, I think you probably saw that uh, for the second year in a row, uh, our Purpose Power Index research that we conducted here in the USA, for the second year in a row, Seventh Generation was the brand the US public saw as the single most purpose-driven brand in the country. And it was up against some stiff competition both years. Um, so we're particularly interested in talking to you sort of about uh, how purpose uh, guides you generally, and, and I think more specifically, things that happened in this sort of tumultuous 2020 that we just went through. So uh, why don't you just maybe start out by telling us a little bit about your higher purpose at Seventh Generation, sort of where did it come from um, and uh, uh, how do you talk about it? Yeah, great. Well, first of all, we are obviously all extremely proud and happy with this amazing acknowledgement for the second year in a row. You know, number one on this list, uh, looking at the other 99 brands is, a, is an achievement that is all making us very, very proud. So thank you so much of that acknowledgement. We really, really appreciate it. So yeah, our mission is in our name. Uh, and we, we lend our name from the great law of the Uruguay that is saying in our every deliberation, we must take into consideration the impact that we're having on the next seven generation. And that is what we do every day and, uh, and every night uh, and waking up with, with that mission in mind in order to really make sure that we build a company whose mission it is to drive a more healthy, sustainable and equitable future for the next seven generations. And obviously that was just as front and center in our 2020 as it was in the years before and the, year, uh, and the years to come. Yeah, but I'm, I'm wondering, though, I don't know if you're like a lot of companies that we've been talking to um, that are highly purpose driven, which is that I think purpose prepared them well to deal with the events of 2020. But there was just so much unusual going on from the pandemic to um, social unrest, uh, concerns about equality, etc. I'm wondering if there were, um, I don't know, special concerns or considerations that you guys were, were thinking about as you tried to live your purpose uh, in, in this particular year. Absolutely, absolutely. The first big consideration we obviously had uh, being a company that not only sells 
Yeah, amazing plant-based laundry detergent, but also toilet paper and disinfectant products. We were out of stocks. We could not keep up with our supply, which was horrible because yeah, specifically in periods where people are really looking for our products, specifically our disinfecting problems and our hand wash, it was just so hard for us that we need to disappoint people and could not supply them with the products that they were looking for. So that was a super big disruption for us in 2020 when I look at uh, the external market. Obviously, internally at Seven Generation, this has been a difficult year for all of us, and it still is, you know, everybody uh, needing to work from home, trying to really balance sort of family life, children that need attention with everybody doing their day to day job was very, very difficult. Yeah, so I think it challenged all of us as a leader and it challenged us as a business. Absolutely. Yeah, as a leader, I have adopted the motto, which is around yeah, lead with an open heart and heart and a calm mind. I think definitely in periods like this that are just so volatile and unpredictable, you know, making sure that we care in the way that we always care, but also making sure that we keep calm is just so extremely important in order to navigate through storms like this. And so that's how we try to manage this. Of course, one of the first things that we did that was donating products to the people who need it most. And specifically our disinfectant products and our hand wash products, where we had them, we made sure that they came into the hands of the most vulnerable populations and to make sure that we did our part in order to, uh, in order to give people the products that they needed most at that point in time. Uh, it's so interesting. Uh, I, I'm wondering, so, so uh, you, that, that's obviously something you did for your internal, uh, your external stakeholders. I'm wondering, could you talk a little bit more about maybe um, how Purpose uh, guided you for your internal stakeholders? Maybe just in general, but, but also in particular this year. Was, was there um, anything in particular that um, helped you guide your, um, your, your internal stakeholders, your, your everyday employees? Yeah, that's, that's, an, that's a great question. And one of the things I love absolutely the most about being at Seven Generation is that all 160 people that work for Seven Generation live and breathe the mission of the company. It is a bunch of people that is just so extremely passionate and caring about each other, about our community, and about the world that we live in, because all of us deeply understand that nobody can live a healthy life on a sick planet. So it's amazing that specifically in a year like 2020, people show up being so purpose focused themselves and everybody is contributing to how we're going to keep this business going, how we're going to keep it as purpose centers as this can be, and how are we really focusing on doing the most important things that we need to do. And as we always do year after year, we really incentivize that as well. And I think that's one of the uniquenesses. Uh, our incentive systems is not only based upon uh, the products that we sell, but it's also very much based upon um, our company mates, our sustainability and our advocacy goals. And uh, you said your advocacy goals was the last thing you said? Yeah. yeah. Well, I was particularly interested in, in that also when you say advocacy, because um, I, I know you, you guys obviously have a strong association with all uh, many things environmental and sustainability oriented. Um, but uh, I, I think we've heard from a lot of other folks attending the, the summit that um, in, in the last 12 to 18 months in particular, they were, in addition to the pandemic, they were dealing with a lot of other societal issues that their employees were very concerned about, whether it be anything from racial equality to any of the other kind of social uh, unrest issues that, you know, have been in the news. I'm wondering, um, was that part of kind of uh, the, the way that you needed to respond in the past uh, few months? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And of course, eh, if you're in a mission-oriented company, who is looking about creating a more equitable world, we cannot stand aside if a societal impact unfolds like it was unfolding in 2020. And just like many other companies, we're on our journey in order to make sure that we are working as hard as we can to become an anti-racist company and to address white supremacy within all our systems. 
it is such an important journey and we take it extremely serious and are very, very, very committed to it. Uh, interesting. Interesting. And, and so can, can you talk at all about, you, you said it becoming an anti-racist company. Are, are there some things in particular that um, kind of support that, that stance that you do? Yeah, sort of like as a mission-driven company, one of the things that we advocate most about is climate justice, because there is a extreme inequality in the effects of climate's impact in the groups of society. As in so many other areas, the most marginalized people get hit first. And therefore, externally, we are upon a journey to fight climate justice. That's one of the most important things that we have so sharply on our radar and will continue to do so. And the reason that is, and the reason we advocate in that space is because we feel it's super important yeah, for people to move their laundry detergent from plant-based to plant-based from petroleum-based. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but you know, most of the conventional laundry products in the business are petroleum-based. And we know we cannot get to the climate change goals that we all have if we don't find ways to leave fossil fuel in the ground. It's so important that we're going to do that. So therefore, we know we need to move people from petroleum-based detergent into plant-based detergent. What we also know, Chip, is that is a wonderful thing to do, but it's not going to solve all of our problems at all, right? And therefore, we're putting a lot of effort to make sure that we transition to a new renewable uh, economy. And so one of the key pillars of Seven Generation is to fight for climate justice because we know the impact of climate change is unequal. And we will do that by moving people to plant-based detergent, but also really putting a lot of effort in the transition to a more renewable economy. And uh, the advocacy team in Seven Generation leads that. And of course, my role as a marketing uh, person is to make sure that we give that movement a microphone so that we create a mobilization and we create a movement for people to get involved because as a brand, we cannot do this by ourselves. Yeah, and creating the movement to drive the systemic change that we all want to see is one of the key objectives uh, that we have. And, uh, you know, to, 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 to stay on that a little bit, because it's, I think it's also nice to tell you a little bit more how we did that in 2020. Yeah, so in ah. 2020, we came out of the gate with an amazing climate justice campaign. Uh, then, of course, because of, the, um, because of the pandemic, we needed to focus our attention to talk to people and engage with people on where they could find our products. But then in the fall, we knew we had another really big objective, which is getting people out to vote and vote with the next seven generations in mind. And so then we had a campaign in the second half of 2020 that was really encouraging people to come out and vote. And to not only vote, but to vote with the next seven generations in mind. And obviously, uh, when you vote with the next seven generations in mind, you are voting with climate justice in mind, because that's one of the most important things that we can leave for, for the next seven generations. So that is how we uh, structured our campaigns in, uh, in 2020. Well, yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, because you guys are obviously a brand that's done a lot in the social activism front. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, you, you, you are a business and, and you need to do regular marketing to, to I guess, you know, to, to sell products. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about either your thoughts, your philosophy, your experience about using purpose in, in more traditional marketing where you got to gotta sell stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's a great challenge. Um, and the way we talk about this is our mission is our business and our business is our mission. Yeah, our business fuels our investment in our mission and our mission fuels the growth in our business. So in my view, it's a perfect circle. The one cannot live without the other. And it's so important for us to prove that model because I think it's the only model eh, as we go into uh, the next uh, decade, knowing the problems that we as a society have to uh, have to fight. So. It's the only model and uh, it works. It absolutely works. And one anecdote that I always lo love to talk about is that if I look at all of the people that we serve and all of the people that know Seven Generation, I can split them between people who know about us and people who know about our mission. 
of the people who know about our mission, not only are those people two times more loyal, but they also rank us far higher, even up to three times higher on really functional key attributes, like is worth the value, has products that works, da, 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 da. So not only does it really drive consumer loyalty when people know about our mission, it also moves the needle on uh, making sure that people know that these products really, really work, and they do. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is a super important part, not only about the story that we tell, but also the business that we're building. Well, that's a perfect segue to the, the another thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, you know, a, as a kind of consumer products company, you've got to do a lot of innovation um, just to, to keep up. You know, the markets you're in are full of innovation. And I'm wondering, how do you guys think about purpose informing how you innovate uh, in terms of products and services? Is it just that you think about just, uh, the next seven generations or is there something more uh, more specific? Yeah, it is such an important question. Because we operate in a dirty industry and we have a huge role to transform it, to transform it uh, from its dependence upon black carbon to a uh, more sustainable green carbon. But also it's an industry where there is so much room to compact and to concentrate. Uh, one of the examples is our easy dose liquid laundry detergent. It's eight time concentrated and it has an automatic dosing. It's the best innovation that we've done in seven generation in a total of our history. It is taking out 70% of packaging and water and waste and people love it. What, Cause why would you chunk around these big laundry bus, bottles if you can really concentrate your way into, uh, into, uh, into your laundry chores, right? So there is a lot of work to be done in this industry and we're absolutely taking a leading role and, um, yeah, we uh, we will continue to do so because innovating our way to more sustainable solutions, as you're saying, Chip, is just such an important component of it. That's fantastic. Um, Hanukkah, I wanted to thank you. You've been uh, such a great uh, guest and speaker, letting us know about, uh, again, the number one purpose brand and the Purpose Power Index for second year in a row is seventh generation. I'm sure thanks a lot to your efforts, Hanukkah. So again, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it, it's been fantastic. It was really, really nice to be part of it. And again, thank you so much. We're so proud of this amazing acknowledgement. Thank you so much. Have a good day. We uh, talk about purpose as like some why statement about your company, but I think in the public's mind, it's kind of a it's a holistic story in their mind about sort of everything they know about you that you do. And when you got an outage, you you get accused of purpose washing. There's another word for it. It's called lipstick on a pig, I think. But <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it's interesting because when we talk about big companies, it's easy to pull them apart because there's so many components to them. But when you start to talk about the startup companies that really are born with purpose at the forefront of what they do, it becomes a holistic way that they activate, the way they communicate, the way they go to business, like it becomes a part of their business model. And I think that's really the differentiator. My name is Lisa Hafenberg. I am the head of Movement Inside at Strawberry Frog. And today I am thrilled to talk to Roxana Shirkoda, who is head of social impact at Zoom. So needless to say, this year has been a big one for Zoom. 2020, the world needed to hunker down at home, but still remain connected to work, school, family, and friends. Uh, so very glad to welcome Roxana. Uh, and before starting sharing your social impact report from 2020, let's talk a little bit about the role of purpose and how your organization experienced it before 2020. What was the purpose? How did you activate it internally amongst the employees and also externally? Thanks so much for the question, Lisa. 
Purpose plays an incredibly significant role in the day-to-day -day work at Zoom. It's felt deeply through all of our employees. It particularly shows up in our work with our customers and happy to speak to kind of overall what that has looked like in the last several years. I think a little, little known fact is that Zoom turns 10 this year. So uh, for our 10th birthday, I think it's um, particularly relevant to share that for 10 years, our company has been really built on the foundation of delivering happiness. And to think about a company our size and with our global reach really centered on delivering happiness to people and really what that purpose means for everyone in the everyday work. I mean, it definitely brings a smile to my face. I don't know about you, but it's such a kind of core and fundamental part of our work. And Eric Yuan, our CEO from day one, 10 years ago, made sure to embed a core value of care into our culture. If you ask anyone kind of how do we center ourselves or what are we focused on, it's caring. It's caring for our customers. It's caring for our teammates. It's caring for ourselves. And when I think about kind of the purpose of delivering happiness through our video communications platform and caring for everyone, including ourselves, I can't help but just feel that sense of purpose and that sense of inspiration and drive. And that's been part of our company for a decade now. Well, I love that. That's fantastic. Um, so if you take us through the events now of last year, 2020, so everything began to unfold in March, as we know, uh, did that reshape Zoom's purpose or did you have to reprioritize some of your specific initiatives, internal and external? Yeah, of course, no one was prepared for um, what the pandemic would bring globally. You know, it was an incredible hard time, uh, a, a tragic time, an unexpected time. And when I think about kind of how we have led with our purpose for several years, um, you know, actually one example I'll share prior to 2020 is that, you know, we as a company from early on, were really focused on the education space. And, you know, if I think about even to our earliest customers, one of our first customers was in the higher education space. And core to our focus was helping education achieve, you know, education institutions achieve their outcomes um, and their impact um, at scale and deeper leveraging our platform. And so when I think about, you know, what happened when the pandemic hit in March, we really looked to our past to say, how are we going to show up right now in this moment? And it was a no brainer for us to think about our trajectory in the education space and say, we're going to offer our platform for free to K through 12 institutions around the world to ensure continued learning, seamless transition to remote learning. And we know that was a really difficult time for parents, for teachers, for students. And if there was anything that we could do to remove that stress or that burden through our platform, it was an easy decision and one that we wanted to do to really support, um, you know, folks going through the pandemic, especially um, when things kind of completely got thrown off um, in March of last year. I think another area I'll call out in terms of um, not necessarily reprioritizing our initiatives, but very much doubling down on them, you know, in March, um, you know, the senseless murder of Breonna Taylor, you know, come May, the murder of George Floyd. Our company had for so many years a really concerted focus on diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, but really in, in 2020 is when we doubled down on that focus and our diversity, equity, and inclusion team was formed. And the same goes for our philanthropic program, Zoom Cares. Our social impact work had for so many years been in play. Employees were donating funds, were volunteering. The company was making charitable contributions. But last year, again, was a no-brainer to double down on that work. And our social impact arm was formed. Um, and the company distributed over $5 million of funding into the COVID relief um, ecosystem, as well as the racial justice ecosystem. So I'd say the events unexpected of 2020 really turned the volume up in a lot of ways in our education work, which had been around for quite some time, as well as our diversity and social impact work. 
Yeah, that's great to hear. And, and I know you also do have the social impact report um, as well. Any, any highlights from that that you would like to mention? Sure, happy to. Um, so I think one incredible just number to share as I talked about our support in the education space. So we supported over 125,000 education organizations with free access and unlimited access to our platform. And I really appreciate our data science and analytics teams were helping us get to this number that we supported over 95 billion minutes of learning last year. And we know that that wasn't easy. Again, it was a really difficult transition in some cases for folks to um, adapt in a new way. But we know through feedback and outreach from teachers and students um, that that access to our platform made a huge difference. And, um, you know, we share a lot of stories about that in our social impact report about how uh, we were able to further um, learning outcomes. We also worked with some really incredible and resilient nonprofit organizations. I think that, you know, last year pushed every service-based organization to think about how do they deliver services to the community that's really struggling. How do you do that remotely? How do you do that when you can't go in person to the people who are most in need? And for us, it was um, a huge responsibility to support those organizations and to move, you know, over $5 million from a company was key. But when I look at the report and I see there's, you know, there's a section where we talk about our employees and I think it's a little over $450,000 of funds that our employees contributed out into um, the nonprofit space and employees who found ways to volunteer their time to cook food for their community or to volunteer digitally using our platform. Um, that's just what brings me the most amount of inspiration is that during a time where our business was overwhelming, I might say, in terms of growth um, and pace. You know, we went from 10 million daily meeting participants to 300 daily meeting participants. And we think about the impact of that scaled growth almost overnight. Um, you know, it was felt throughout our business and, and for our employees. And I think that we were able to really balance that uh, explosive growth in terms of serving, you know, the global users who were dependent on our platform to stay connected day to day with, you know, the response to the pandemic, with response to the cry for racial justice across the world. And, you know, I think that that explosive growth really just allowed us to actually further live into our purpose and recognizing that we were impacting so many more people's lives. Um, and we took that pretty seriously. Well, thank you for sharing that. So continue talking about the purpose. How did purpose really act as a guide when you were dealing with all this? You talked about the unprecedented growth and this unprecedented business demands of, of last year, all the practicalities around it. How, how did the purpose guide you? Yeah, that's a great question. I think about purpose as, you know, tapping into each individual's sense of inspiration and kind of their meaning, right? Like that, why are they doing the work that they're doing? Are they connected to that work in a way that they feel makes a difference? And I think that there's this really beautiful um, relationship to working at Zoom and being able to see your work change people's lives. And I think that, you know, as I just said, that folks were kind of um, overnight shifted to a remote work environment themselves. You know, we, even though we are Zoom, have offices <laughs> where people would go into the office and connect with one another and had to shift to a remote workforce. Um, personally, folks had to deal with the implications of the pandemic as individuals before they were Zoom employees, you know, let alone the growth of our company. And I think that sense of purpose and seeing the deep impact of our work and our platform on hundreds of millions of people around the world really helped folks push through, right? Like people showed up day in and day out to ensure that our platform was working seamlessly. And I think an important thing to note is that again, going back to our CEO, our founder, Eric, 
you know, he made it incredibly clear to employees last year that this isn't a time to try and upsell our business or create some fancy marketing plan. It was a time to care for our communities and to recognize that our platform was connecting people who couldn't see their family members, who couldn't attend weddings, who couldn't celebrate birthdays, who were in some cases connecting with family members in the hospital that they couldn't go see in person. And that deep sense of connectedness to the community and, and that sense of, again, like care being our deeply um, felt value, I think is what pushed through the unprecedented time and the, and the real pressure, frankly, on the business. Right. Yeah, it really sounds on you that the purpose is not just uh, a nice something you have printed on the boardroom wall, but it's something that you're using in your day to day, in your practical business, in, in, in everything you do. So that's, exactly. that's yeah. uh, any other practical um, in, pra in terms of practicalities, any other great examples you have, how really the purpose is guiding you Any 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 tips for our for our viewers? Sure. I mean, I think a really tactical thing, you know, that uh, just to your point, it's not something that's just written on a, on, a, on a boardroom wall or in a pamphlet somewhere, is that, you know, our leadership team reiterates the kind of message, if you will, and the core focus on delivering happiness and living, you know, throughout our day to day with a sense of care repeatedly. It's not something that you might hear during your new hire onboarding training or that, you know, you might see if you're walking through the halls of the office. It's, you know, we have bi-weekly um, all hands, company all hands, and every single meeting, our leadership team, Eric, our CEO, as well as other folks, say and talk about authentically, genuinely why these things matter, right? And what it looks like to do this work. They'll highlight examples of customer stories where we've gotten feedback. And, you know, there's this really incredible culture. This is a I'll say just kind of a funny, maybe quirk of, um, of Zoom. In addition to these, you know, all hands meetings where you're going to hear and see examples and feel that sense of purpose. Um, we have an incredible culture um, of chat, which might sound um, kind of funny if you think about, you know, we're a, a global company, thousands of employees, a household name at this point. Um, but we have this culture where folks chat with one another quite often internally. And, um, you know, you've got 5,000 employees in some cases in some chat groups sharing examples of how our work makes a difference in people's lives, sharing examples of how they individually went out of their way to take care of someone in their community. And our entire executive team is in those chats. Managers are in those chats. Every single employee is in there plus one -ing, you know, heart emoji, really recognizing and applauding these examples and these day-to-day -day efforts. And it's a culture where we celebrate one another and we feel connected. And, you know, frankly, I haven't met a single coworker or employee at Zoom in person since I've started. I have been virtual and remote. But through these venues of, you know, our all hands meetings or in these chat group conversations, I feel that deep sense of connection and care. And I think for other companies to think about how do you decentralize structures that make these types of conversations accessible, that make them informal, that make them feel, um, you know, like they are part of the day to day and, and not make them feel that way, but because they are part of the day to day and that you, you know, naturally and organically allow employees to show up and, and express, you know, that they care or that they're living in their day to day work with purpose um, and celebrate it. And I think that that's something that our team, um, does from top to bottom, you know, side to side across the entire company. So very quickly before we end, what are you the most excited about moving forward in this unpredictable, uncertain world of ours? Yeah, there is quite a bit of uncertainty. You know, I'll speak to this from my social impact lens, you know, from overseeing our social impact work, there is quite a bit of um, uncertainty going forward, right? We still have um, a global focus as a company, and there are countries who are experiencing a second wave of the pandemic's um, effects of COVID-19's impact on communities. And I think what I'm most excited about is for 
all the learnings from this last year, right? How do we show up for folks even when we can't physically be together? How do we as a company rise to the occasion of an unprecedented pandemic? How do we as you know, employees respect and trust one another's day-to-day lives being chaotic and challenging while having to show up for work. I think that all of those things for me, where from where I sit, um, is what I'm most excited about is to say, you know, six, nine months from now, 12 months from now, if we're in this utopic scenario where we no longer have a pandemic and we've kind of created, um, you know, a, a new day-to-day, um, that we're still thinking a lot about community that are dealing with challenges, individuals who are dealing with challenges, right? The pandemic was an accelerant to those challenges that folks are experiencing. It didn't create entirely new ones. And so I think when we, when we consider, you know, racial justice work, access to education, just naming two that we care deeply about, um, I'm really thrilled to see that folks are making long-term commitments and I'm excited for folks to um, stay true to those commitments, ourselves included. Thank you so much, Roxana, on behalf of the Purpose Power Summit. Um, We loved speaking to you today, learning more about how purpose has been such a core part of Zoom's success in the past and hopefully will be in the future as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. Really great to be with you today. Take care. Hi, everybody, and thanks for being with us here at the Purpose Power Summit 2021. This is the very first event of its kind, so we're especially excited to have you here. Our discussions today, as you may have guessed, focus on purpose, but there's so much more than that. You'll hear inspiring revelations from business leaders, frank discussions on internal company culture, and profoundly useful insights on clarifying, activating, and staying true to your purpose, even in the face of tremendous difficulty. I mean, the last year has just been extraordinary. Here's a look at what's in store. editor at large Tom Foster Uh, welcome to this session of the purpose power summit the chicken or the egg does a category drive purpose or does purpose transcend categories Uh, I'm excited about this subject because it gets right to the heart of brand purpose um, in the sense that 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 it it gets to the question of whether purpose is uh, something that is innate in a category or something that has to be sort of intentionally built Um, we have three rock stars from three very different uh, industries here to talk about this subject with us Uh, with us today are Deanna Bratter, she is the head of sustainable development for Danone North America. Also Vivek Bapat, the senior vice president in charge of purpose and sustainability marketing at SAP. And finally, Terry Ballack is the director of global external communications at Kimberly Clark. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Deanna, I want to start with you. Um, let's let's. I, w- I would like to ask you just very simply. Can can you explain a little bit what? purpose means within your company, how you guys define purpose? Sure. Uh, Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I definitely think it's helpful to start with an understanding of what is purpose. Uh, When we think about purpose companies and purpose brands, which for us at Danone is a company that thinks and acts in ways that uh, put forward the collective interests of all stakeholders, society and the planet, both short term and long term, together with business strategy and also business growth ambitions. Um, For us at Danone, uh, our company was founded uh, over 100 years ago in 1919 in Spain um, with a a focus on helping people suffering from uh, intestinal disorders, in particular related to malnutrition. So purpose in terms of striving to help society uh, and solve a problem was key to the beginning, the growth of the business. And then later on in 1972, the CEO at the time, Antoine Ribou, gave a speech that is often thought of as quite historic, both for our company and for social business, 
and really um, set the stage that uh, responsibility doesn't stop at the factory or office door, uh, that it's clear that growth should no longer be an end in and of itself, but a tool serve to serve the quality of life uh, and not be detrimental to it. So that really set the stage more than 100 years ago for Danone and how our company um, activates purpose uh, and lives it within our business. Uh, that idea of social and economic impact uh, continues to grow strong, and I think it's best represented um, through the reality that today we are one of the world's largest certified B corporations. And here in North America, we are incorporated as a public benefit corporation. And this means that legally through our articles of incorporation, we are committed to balancing people, purpose, profit, and focusing on a broad set of stakeholders, including society and environment in our business growth ambition. Um, and then one step further than that legal framework is really the B Corp certification, which is uh, a voluntary certification that any for-profit business can um, participate in. And it really puts together these ideas of not just performance on those social and environmental topics, but also governance and how purpose is tied to your core governance and then transparency. Um, it's great to make commitments to do the work, but really driving it through transparency and a willingness to uh, be very clear on how you balance profit and purpose is critical. And so being part of this movement of public benefit corps and B corps is also a way where we can be part of a movement helping all business, all categories, industries see the role they can play in using their business as a force for good. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, Vivek, I want to ask you uh, the same question. How do you, uh, within your company, uh, how is purpose defined? Yeah, so I think very similar to um, how Deanna articulated the story of Danone, right? Uh, purpose has been a central part of SAP's strategy for the, for the last 50 years since its inception. And um, what we have tried to do is to really um, be very particular and, and intentional about what our purpose is based upon the growth of the organization over, over that time period. So for instance, at its inception, um, the purpose of SAP was really uh, around solving business problems uh, for technologists and business um, you know, leaders around the world. And when we found that um, these businesses began to have an outsized impact on the local communities, for instance, in which they operated and the world at large, SAP's purpose expanded to help to basically articulate um, how we were, through our customers, enabling and helping the world run better. And once social media and consumerization actually entered into um, the mainstream of business activity, what we felt was that through the work that we were doing with our technology, with our customers, and through the work that our customers were actually doing with their end customers, we were ultimately trying to impact the lives of people that we ultimately touched. So the purpose of SAP has intentionally grown over those periods of, of, of time, and it's kept pace with, I would say, the, the market forces, the situational demands um, on businesses in the state of the world, and um, the way that we look at purpose is really uh, twofold. The first is that of an exemplar of purpose, meaning because we operate a business and we're a business entity of, you know, ourselves, what is the type of example that we can set for our peers in the industry and those that we touch? So there's an exemplar view of purpose. And then the second, which is an actually huge um, opportunity and a privilege role for, for the company is how can we enable our customers through the use of our products and solutions and technologies, realize their own purpose. And I'm really proud to be uh, on a panel here where, you know, um, I know Kimberly Clark and, um, you know, Danone are both uh, amazing customers of SAP. And, and, you know, by virtue of the work that we do with more than 400,000 customers all over, over the world, we're able to actually help um, realize not just our purpose, but also help um, many of these organizations, large and small, achieve their own uh, vision and purpose as well. And touch consumers sort of that way as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, fascinating. Uh, Terry, same question to you. 
Yeah, I think it's fascinating because, you know, much like Deanna, Kimberly Clark actually will celebrate its 150th anniversary next year. So since 1872, when we were founded in Wisconsin, you know, there's been this element of care that's been behind every single thing that we do. And we think about that from the very beginning of what we know about the company. And so through this lens, as I think about how purpose has really come to fruition for Kimberly Clark, it's been around this idea of better care and this idea that we can do more to advance that. And, you know, just think about the different products that we offer. Um, you know, they've, they've certainly been in the spotlight, but as you think about even before the pandemic, what you saw is, you know, 2 billion people around the world who don't have access to sanitation and clean water. You have people that, you know, are still experiencing a lot of the stigmas related to periods and incontinence. And so we think about it in the sense of how do we provide better care, but we do, you know, put that at the intersection of what we provide in terms of solutions to those, because, you know, I think more than ever, we've realized how essential our products are to people and how much people rely on them when they're not there. So we really think about that uh, as part of the context and, and the types of uh, programs that we pursue, but it is that kind of singular focus on care that I think really rises above and has really been a part of who we are for 150 years and is really starting to become, you know, clearer to us, you know, coming out of the pandemic. I think it's fascinating that that each of you talked about sort of the long histories of of, of the companies you work for, uh, and and how purpose has sort of grown and evolved, you know, as the companies have grown and evolved and diversified. Um, it, it's the the parallel is 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 really interesting. I, Terry, I want to stick with you for just a moment and 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 ask sort of a natural extension to that, which is that okay, you know, we've talked about sort of evolution over over this long period of time in the company's history. We have just come through 15 months or so of, of really, um, you know, a, a, a radical shift uh, uh, due to the pandemic and, and, and really some other factors that occurred, uh, you know, pretty, pretty dramatic forces that, that we all navigated over the last year and change. Um, I, I would love to know sort of how purpose within Kimberly-Clark uh, evolved over that time in the last, you know, year, year and a half. Yeah, I think it, you know, it, it's, it's a tough place to play, I think, in the sense that, you know, for us, it was uncomfortable that sometimes toilet paper was more of the story than the pandemic itself. It, it, um, it's a difficult place to be because you realize that um, this, this wasn't necessary to be in this place. But ultimately, what we've seen is that, you know, the supply chain itself was exposed in, in lots of, of different ways. And we sat there and we looked at it and we said, we know that our products are absolutely essential to consumers, but we won't be able to meet those needs if we don't start with our own people. And so when we looked at all that through the lens of care, the intersection, if you will, is really around this idea of taking our purpose and saying, we have to put the health and safety of our people first and foremost, as we go about any plans that we, we look at, because if, if they're not available to make them, we're not available to deliver them. And so we saw that as, you know, absolutely critical element to say, when we think about putting their, um, their health, their safety, their family's health and safety at the forefront, um, you know, it became our kind of way to make sure that our essential products made it to consumers. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I think uh, um, we saw our brands pick up on what the company did uh, almost naturally. We started working from home in terms of our offices, um, you know, a good two, two and a half weeks before most U.S. businesses started taking that action. Um, it's the same in our, our manufacturing facilities when it came to putting in those protocols. But, you know, I think as it went on and it went on and it went on, what we realized is we needed to bring our consumers on this journey with us now, right? And so you started to see some of the advertising that we did was around uh, Share Square. And this is just a simple idea, but through that lens of purpose and caring, this idea of one of the ways we can care for, for one another, for our neighbor, for our communities is to, to not hoard toilet paper. And if there's someone in need, share a square, share a role. And, um, you know, it was very inspiring to a lot of our people that our brands took that kind of action as well, because they're working as hard as they can 
uh, you know, 24 seven to make these essential products. And so to see our brands then chipping in with marketing that reminded consumers of how they can extend uh, this kind of care during this time really meant a lot. And I think it really propelled us to, you know, be more articulate in our purpose as a company. You know, again, as I said, almost 150 years, we've had this sense of care, but it became so uh, singular a focus throughout. Fascinating. Um, I, Deanna, I would like to, to throw that question to you as well. I imagine there are some interesting parallels and, and maybe just for the, the differences in, in, in sort of at the product level, maybe some, some, some interesting differences in strategy also as, as, as purpose sort of evolved over this last uh, you know, challenging year and change. Yeah, I would say um, some parallels and some differences being in the food space. Uh, our mission, which is obviously grounded in our purpose, is to bring health through food to as many people as possible. And early on in the pandemic, when we were, you know, somewhat quickly faced with challenges um, across uh, managing supply chain, transportation, in the face of purchasing volatility, panic buying, pantry loading, um, you know, despite a strong food for basic foods like dairy products, um, you know, also the closure of restaurants uh, and schools forced a shift in eating at home uh, to a degree that we've not seen before. And so uh, similarly, our focus was immediately on safety, looking within our business, across our business, ensuring that we were implementing everything we could to protect our employees, keeping a safe working environment, uh, and keeping uh, our lines running because the demand uh, was ever increasing. Um, there's also an element of really feeling a sense of responsibility uh, uh, to support and engage deeply within our supply chain. So uh, we can focus on our manufacturing. We also have hundreds of dairy farmers across the US uh, and then of course a variety of other uh, ingredients sourced globally, uh, but really making sure that we were keeping the lines of communication open, that we were securing uh, things like PPE, not just for our employees, um, you know, those who we could tuck safe at home, we did, and others who needed to stay on what we call the front lines of the food system, um, you know, we needed to do our part to protect them. So I think there was absolutely a huge activation and a huge effort there. And that's really a, a responsibility of the business, of any business. Um, as we've gone through this, but then we also had um, those societal impacts that were rapid and um, pretty quickly emerging. For example, um, when it comes to food security, uh, pre-pandemic, um, one out of every eight, and then more recently, one out of every seven before the pandemic, were suffering from some level of food insecurity. Um, during the early months of the pandemic, it quickly shifted to one in six Americans facing hunger or food insecurity, either without access or without funds to be able to get the foods they need. Um, and when they were able to get food, is it fresh food? Is it balanced food? And is it healthy food going back to the mission? So this was another area where we were able to activate both in our own um, uh, warehouses and our own products of making sure that we were getting food to people in need, but also in supporting other nonprofits and partners so that we could get food moved, uh, get it accessed, and make sure that those who were in need um, uh, were getting the food and the nutrition that they needed. So a variety of platforms there. Uh, we had one brand in particular, a Too Good Yogurt brand, whose mission um, is it's a newer brand. It's only about two years old, and their mission is around um, uh, reducing waste in the food system. So they've recently launched a program where uh, they secure otherwise wasted um, fruit from the fields um, and then uh, create a product. It's called Good Save, where they're using, in this case, Meyer lemons that would have otherwise been wasted. It's a verified rescued fruit is what it's called. Um, and then uh, putting that in product. And then proceeds from that product work in partnership with nonprofits um, like City Harvest, making sure that other otherwise wasted food get to people in need. So really looking at a systems approach, um, and we saw during the pandemic, not only was need at an all-time high, but waste was at an all-time high. Uh, and so when we can look for these opportunities to sort of close the gap across the system, I think that's when um, purpose really feels like it's coming together and when we can have uh, systems-wide positive impact uh, and at least do our best to close those loops. That's a really cool example. Um, Vivek, I, I, I keep thinking of you as I listen to those last two answers because, you know, thinking about 
companies like Kimberly Clark and Danone, and as they had to um, really urgently scramble to deliver on their purpose in 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 a in a you know very uh, quickly radically changed environment, I imagine that changed you know the company's needs, your clients' needs in really interesting ways, and I'm curious how that played out at SAP uh, over the past, uh, again, you know, 15 months or so? Yes, Tom, I think um, one of the, the advantages, I would say, the um, sort of the uniqueness uh, that we have within our business is being able to serve so many different customers across so many different regions. And so what we're able to see is what are some of the big patterns that emerge out of these regional as well as global situations. Um, I think as Terry and Deanna have, have talked about before, our primary focus when the COVID crisis hit was making sure that we did everything for our own workforce and our people. So that was the first thing that we focused on, whether it was remote work, whether it was health uh, related to mental health, um, you know, the human dimension, uh, specifically the focus on employees and workforce was absolutely the number one priority. And by extension, we knew that this was a priority for many of our customers as well. So what we came up with were specific dedicated solutions and packages that we offered in many cases free to our customers so that they were able to manage their workforce very, very effectively at the time. But we also knew that maintaining business continuity for most businesses was a super critical issue. So how do you, you know, now that, now that you're all of a sudden dealing with the distributed workforce that you might not have dealt with before, how do you maintain business continuity? So we were able to enable our customers with specific solutions, again, to help them maintain business continuity as they navigated this crisis themselves. At the same time, what we also saw was that um, there were other social issues that were, were popping up as, as well. As we know, you know, during this crisis, we've seen uh, not just the immediate response that was needed for COVID, but there were lots of other big issues that were magnified. And in some cases, um, the, the way that we went about it was um, by partnerships through multiple NGOs and organizations to speed up relief efforts, for instance. But in other cases, uh, what we were able to do is to bring together many of our customers within the same domain, for instance, within the pharmaceutical domain and bring them all together as one network or as one community to be able to share information and data with each other so that the collaboration across um, these partners was much more efficient. So in fact, in terms of responding to the delivery, the supply chain delivery, I would say, the logistics involved with the delivery of these vaccines, many of these vaccines, we were able to bring in 18 of the top 20 pharmaceutical companies together so that they could actually collaborate on a single platform to enable faster responsiveness to the to the crisis and to the, the to the delivery um, of of you know vaccines into into people's arms. So there's a multitude of things that we were able to do, but at the same time, uh, what we knew was that uh, the longer term issues, particularly related to climate change, and I think Diana, you brought up the the idea of waste, for instance. Um, in these global supply chains, those problems were not going away. So in some ways, what, it, what, the, what this, the, the period over the last 12 months has helped us do is to really come um, you know, to terms with what is it that we do in a way that's unique and differentiated and can scale across the world. And what we've landed on is basically three core topics. The first one is around um, you know, climate action, which is enabling companies to really get a handle on carbon footprint and emissions, not just within their business, but across their extended network of partners. So that's one big area that we're focused on. The second one is um, the reduction um, and elimination of waste in supply chains. I think, Diana, you brought up the food example. We know that um, food insecurity is a huge problem even in America. So how do you actually you know, reduce or, or create alternative uses for products and create new sources of supply as well as demand in those types of supply chains. But there are other issues as well. So packaging, packaging materials, for instance, related to plastics. So we're looking at those types of big problems across multiple supply chains, and we're focused on eliminating or you know, helping companies move into the circular economy. And then the final piece is 
really uh, looking at um, issues related to social justice. And so being able to provide companies the ability to source from diverse su suppliers, for instance, or be able to ensure that whatever they're uh, procuring um, and supplying to others is based on ethical human practices. So we've landed very, very clearly on three or four significant um, areas where we believe we can have a disproportionate impact. Uh, that's powerful, and those are huge areas. Um, really interesting. Um, it, it's also a really good seg. I think I want to, uh, Vivek, stick with you for the, this next question um, uh, to start, uh, which is I want to get at you know the, the central question for this session, which is um, you know we, we talked about uh, chicken or egg. You know, does does is 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 purpose. Uh, sort of innate in a category, or is it something that one needs to sort of build intentionally? I think you were sort of alluding to that just now, but I would love for you to sort of directly address that question. Yeah, I mean, I think from our perspective, you know, purpose is about authenticity. And authenticity is about what are the values of the company, right? And I think when you, when you start looking at uh, an intentional strategy around purpose, as opposed to um, you know, purpose just being some kind of a side project somewhere, right? When you start looking at purpose as a core part of your business strategy, then what you, what you are, are basically able to do is to make sure that, um, you know, you, you, you're, you're able to actually be very finely attuned to the needs of your customers, right? The markets that you serve, the communities that you're in, and be able to intentionally come up with almost a strategic approach to purpose, you know, as opposed to a philanthropic or just a CSR orientation to purpose. And in our case, what we have done is um, the way that we articulate purpose and sustainability is a huge issue as well. And I think there's a lot of confusion around some of these terms. The way that we tend to look at it is that purpose is really our brand aspiration and sustainability is the activation of purpose within the customer context. So when we talk to our customers, of course, you know, we'll collaborate on the basis of shared purpose and shared values. But when it comes to the business implementation, this is where SAP is really talking about sustainability in those, in those uh, particular areas that I mentioned, carbon you know, emissions, for instance, climate action, circular economy, and then real, equality and diversity for all. Um, really interesting. Uh, Terry, I want to uh, 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 ask you that same question about sort of is, is, is purpose uh, something that is sort of innately tied to a category or is it um, something that needs to be more, um, be more intentionally built? So first of all, it's a great question. I, I think that as we kind of look back just in the last 18 months, it, it'd be very easy to say um, that the category transcends purpose. But when, when we take a deeper look back and we think about, um, you know, our, our, the categories that we're in are categories that we invented. And so we think all the way back to 1920, when we introduced the Kotex brand coming out of, out of these, you know, observations and uses of our product by nurses on the front lines of World War I, and then saying, wait, our, our products serve a high, higher order, that's really powerful. And so it's always been about this sense of care for our consumers. And as we think about consumers' uh, needs, both ones they know about and what they don't, they lead us to tackle things like stigmas and incontinence and even diaper rash. So, you know, in a lot of ways, we're not trying to solve the problem of a better diaper. We're trying to solve the problem of skin health. We're trying to, to look at how we could keep, uh, you know, women in their careers and girls in schools and things like that, so that the period doesn't get away in the way of their progress and things of that nature. So I, I think that's what's really exciting. And then you put it all to the test, and, and even amidst the pandemic last year, we still forged ahead and announced that we're pursuing science-based targets for climate and new ambitions to have our environmental footprint in areas of plastics and water and forests. So for me, I, it, it became when you look at the big picture, Purpose absolutely transcends our categories. Awesome. Um, Deanna, same, same question to you. Yeah, I am in the camp of purpose transcends categories. I think in part because as uh, at its essence, at the core of uh, business purpose is greater good. 
uh, and the idea that purpose needs to manifest itself from a variety of levels, including from within the company, for our people, with others, across stakeholders, delivering the values that our shareholders expect, delivering on our growth ambition, but also the broader stakeholders of society, of community, even competitors across our categories, and then from the broadest sense out into the world and that greater societal impact that um, we can play a part in. And so, you know, my perspective is that every category needs to be doing its part to address these critical issues like climate change and food insecurity. And these are collective and, and I would say massive problems or challenges, and they will take equally massive collective action to address them. So uh, if, if there are spaces where purpose doesn't uh, transcend category, it should. Um, there is an element of materiality, uh, making sure that as a business, we are focusing on the areas where we have the biggest impact and where we can have the biggest positive impact or role in transformation. Um, and as a food company, we know that uh, from a climate perspective, more than two thirds of our emissions uh, come from agriculture. So, this means we know clearly where we need to lean in, where we need to start, and where we need to play a very active role in transformation. Uh, one of our brands, Horizon Organic Dairy, um, is activating um, purpose through a commitment to be carbon positive uh, by 2025. So carbon neutral and then going beyond to uh, capture more carbon than they create. Uh, and this is pretty radical in a dairy system uh, that produces a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and methane. Um, and by unlocking um, process, practices, technologies, transformation, and honestly, on the ground partnership with farmers, we can implement things like soil health and transition to regenerative agriculture that help change the system and use the category of dairy, in this case, um, for collective effort and collective action. So I think overall, we really see the opportunity to use our purpose to transcend category and deliver that business as a force for good. This is all so fascinating, and I feel like we are, um, we could go on with this conversation for quite a while. I wish we were all in the same room and, um, and had a few hours to, to do that. Um, unfortunately, we are, are, are running out of time right now, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, really fascinating conversation, and uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. It's hard to hope, hard to cope with crisis, so we get to work. We men, fighting for every person in every neighborhood, we, the coming of the common good. So dare to care, to be hope sighted. We're never divided. When we live to give, we always live united. Welcome back. I'm Stephen Hahn Griffiths, Executive Vice President at the Red Truck Company. It's my privilege to be part of this Power of Purpose Summit today. And I just want to say thanks in advance to Inc. Magazine for making this all possible and to Strawberry Frog for inviting me to moderate this discussion. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Sally Sussman, Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Pfizer. Hi, Sally. Great to chat with you today. Hi, Stephen. Great to be with you as well. Thank you. So, Sally, let's just jump right in. Pfizer's purpose is to discover breakthroughs that change patients' lives. And my goodness, that endeavor could not have rung truer since the past 12 months when Pfizer discovered, tested, and rolled out the vaccine that effectively helped save the human race with its COVID-19 discovery. But Sally, I'm sure this wasn't all easy, especially when your starting point was inhibited by some of the persisting misperceptions around Big Pharma. So maybe we can start by looking back in the past it must have been very frustrating. What was it like back then? And what do you think was driving some of those misperceptions around pharma? Stephen, one of the things I could never understand is how companies like Pfizer and other biopharmaceutical companies 
that made life-saving medicines had such abysmal reputations. And in fact, that's why I came to Pfizer in the first place. I had worked at some other consumer products companies that had terrific reputation, lots of uh, great affection for these companies, and they did nice things. But I was looking at a company that makes great investment and takes huge risks for life-saving medicines. They had terrible reputations, you know, almost next to tobacco. And I thought I would come here and understand it and probably fix this in, in about two years' time. That was a great professional challenge to me. Twelve years later, I was still working on the same problem, and I understood it better, but I really hadn't fixed it and didn't get the opportunity to do so until the pandemic and our response with our COVID-19 vaccine. So what do you think was getting in the way? Because as you've said, your company is about ultimately saving lives and this endeavor has been a noble pursuit for scores of years as the entire pharma industry is motivated by helping humankind. Why do you think pharma companies got such a poor rap? Was it the uh, way they were telling this story or there's, was there some underlying greater skepticism or something else getting in the way of, of your potential to earn a stronger reputation? My research to, to try to answer that probing question of yours said that it wasn't a single answer. It wasn't a, a solitary problem. It was a set of things. You know, one is um, an arrogance that the industry had developed at one point. Uh, another problem was a sort of defensiveness and an entrenchment on our part. We weren't out there as much as we should. We were sort of behind the fortress walls of our companies. There, there also uh, is just the fact that when you're talking about people's health and providing medicine, it's a very emotional topic. It's not like you're providing a lipstick or a credit card. It, it's a life and death thing. And if your child is sick or your parents are sick, the emotions run very high. And there was a lot we needed to do and we're beginning to do uh, to bridge that gap and to create greater trust. But it was a long-term uphill project for a long time. Very much appreciate that. Um, and yet as a company, you were able to sort of look beyond the here and now, and you had this incredible North Star, your purpose that you were driving towards. Um, so I'd love to hear more about what was the inspiration behind that purpose? Where did it come from and, and how did it become derived within the walls of, of Pfizer? Thank you so much. It, it means so much to us. We launched our purpose, Breakthroughs That Change Patients' Lives, in January of 2020. And that's when Albert Borla became our CEO. And Albert and the executive team on which I serve felt that we really needed to attach ourselves to a patient-centric purpose. And there are really two key words in that purpose. One is breakthroughs, that we weren't interested in chasing Me Too innovations or small incremental improvements but true life-altering breakthroughs. And the second most important word in that purpose statement is patience and the change patients' lives. Um, our medicines and innovations and vaccines are of value if people can't access them. So we wanted to really lean into the science of breakthroughs and also the accessibility of our medicine and that it should be equitable and accessible to all. So we were already undergoing this transformation and, and becoming much more purposeful before uh, the pandemic hit. So as you think about that, looking ahead now, perhaps more to the future, how does your purpose shape and redefine the destiny, not just of the here and now and where your company is, but what it might mean for the future? It means everything for our future. When the pandemic came, we decided to basically go for it. And we put $2 billion at risk. We didn't take any government money. We were the only company that didn't. We wanted to unleash our scientists to be able to go as quickly as they could. We took a process of drug discovery that tends to be a very linear process and did everything at once, even starting to manufacture ahead of approvals because we knew if it worked, we were gonna need it and need it fast. And so what we now have is first and foremost, a huge proof point that working this way can have incredible outcomes for people. 
The second thing is we now have a reputation to live up to. And so what I think you'll see at Pfizer going forward is a commitment to more bold thinking, more breakthroughs, moving with urgency and having an appetite for risk. And we have no interest in, in going back to the past. Um, I think that probably makes perfect sense to you. We're, we're on a trajectory and we want to keep going. So incredible, all the great work you're doing as a company and, and without question, doing all the right things. But I suppose the other half of the equation is, is getting credit for it and knowing how to speak to that greater sense of purpose, that North Star and fulfillment of that promise. So what are some of the things you've learned in terms of how do you speak to your purpose and how do you unscore it in the court of public opinion in delivering the story in the most authentic and genuine way possible? Credit, again, here goes to my boss, Pfizer CEO, Albert Borla, because when he pulled together the small group of people that would sort of be next to him at the epicenter of this vaccine work, it was, of course, the scientists, the manufacturing experts who figured out how to you know, develop, not only develop, but produce a huge number of vaccines and get them around the world, the regulatory people, clinical trial experts, et cetera. But he also included me. And I, I think that was um, profound, not only because it was the greatest experience in my professional life, but also, and more importantly, because we knew that the public discussion of this work was as crucial as any other part. I mean, imagine, Stephen, the tragedy if we developed a vaccine that no one had the confidence to take. And given the speed with which we were moving and the, the new technology, our mRNA technology, which was brand new technology for vaccine, there could have been you know, far, far greater skepticism. But because um, Albert prioritized it and I had the opportunity to lead it, we did many things differently. Just for one example, we published our clinical trial protocols on our website. You know, in the past, that would not have happened. That's proprietary information that the scientists want to hold dear. But we couldn't afford skepticism, and we really leaned into transparency. That was one thing. Just another one I'll mention quickly is we made ourselves continuously and constantly available and accessible. The number of interviews, the open door policy. We, we had Nat Geo and their documentary team in the building, in the labs, in the factories, filming us during the whole process before we even knew whether we were going to be successful. That's how high the stakes were for public support of this effort. It was an audacious undertaking, uh, delivered with courage and commitment like I've never seen before. It, it's truly incredible how we can look at Pfizer and, and almost claim that as the, the noble white knight within the pharma industry, you've in many ways sort of saved the destiny of humankind. So thank you for everything you've done as a company. Um, but I'm sure in the eye of the storm and all the fast moving dynamics, it must have been incredibly difficult to make decisions and, and rightful choices. The, the $2 billion bet that you've talked about, but even beyond that, the opportunity to tell your story um, is impacted by so many things. So as you were making decisions, how did you prioritize who the narrative was aimed at? Did you start with employees? Did you talk to the media? Did you invest in paid for communication channels? What discerning choices did you make uh, looking back that you thought had the highest impact in driving the story? That's a great question. I, I feel that uh, perhaps for the first time in my career, all audiences merged into one. Um, the kind of audience dissection that tends to happen in our work really wasn't possible or feasible or maybe even advisable. You know, our colleagues were also scared citizens. Our, our website became a content vehicle to the media, to government officials around the world. So what I prioritized more than, you know, to which stakeholder we would go was a, again, a continuous and constant, very transparent and candid dialogue about what was happening inside the company. I, I felt it was essential that people wanted to know that. And, and again, it our, was our availability. So for example, uh, we, we would receive calls from heads of state to Albert Borla, our CEO, 
prime ministers, presidents, kings wanting to talk to him about supply. And typically I'd say, you know, would you like us to call back and see what they want? Would you like me to have a local country manager return that call? And in almost every case, he took the call himself. And that kind of personal touch that people know we were there working 24 seven and we would answer your call was really, really meaningful. Incredible how that transparency paid such great dividends to your company and your reputational gains are almost unprecedented in, in the past 12 months. But I'd hazard a guess it wasn't all perfect inside looking out. And I'm sure along the way, there might have been decisions you might have made differently. So what's perhaps one example looking back of something you might have done differently knowing what you know today? Believe, believe me, there were more than one or two things <laughs> uh, we could have done differently and better. The one that comes most quickly to mind is, I think we could have been quicker to understand the global nature of this crisis. For a while in my mind, it was something that was happening in China. And we had a task force to work with our colleagues in China to understand what was happening, to make protocols around remote work and these sort of things. And this, this crisis taught us a lot, but one thing it, I'll never forget is that the world is so deeply interconnected because of travel, because of technology, something that is happening all the way across the world is really happening in your backyard as well at the same time. And we could have been quicker in, that, in those months of February, March, April, 2020. Yeah, but amazing how literally in the space of 12 months, the whole process has revealed itself to where we are today, where a high percentage of the world is all now vaccinated, thanks to Pfizer and, and many of your peer competitors. Um, and I guess if you think about where your purpose is taking you as a company, it's elevated expectations. In many ways, it's become a, a lofty commitment to fulfilling your purpose as part of this new era of the post-pandemic world. So how are you going to juggle that kind of commitment of being this sort of new hero in the world? And, and what does that now mean for the future of what Pfizer can be associated with kind of on the road ahead? Where, where does this take you as a company? Well, again, we learned a lot and continue to learn as we go forward. Certainly during the pandemic, um, we, we worked very collaboratively across the industry and thought of our competitor as the virus itself. And, and that's an interesting shift that the enemy becomes disease or, or uh, you know, other burdens that the patients feel. The other thing is, believe me, we feel so humble. When, when I get photos from friends or texts from relatives saying they saw grandma for the first time in a year, thank you. I, you know, I get chills, I tear up. Um, we, we are truly humbled by the response the world has had to the reopening created by vaccines made by Pfizer and others. But in terms of going forward, it feels like an incredible moment of opportunity. First of all, mRNA technology itself could be used for many other things, whether it's cancer or, or other severe diseases. When we learned that the vaccine was effective at the super high rates, that it is effective, our chief scientist said, oh my God, this is the biggest medical breakthrough in a century. So I'm excited to see what other breakthroughs and, and treatments and preventions and cures we can create through mRNA technology and other scientific advances. Well, Sally, I feel like I could talk to you all day, but unfortunately we're almost up on our time and perhaps with those words of wisdom, we're gonna wrap up today. And, and just wanna say thank you, Sally, for your time. Those were incredible words of encouragement, enlightenment, and we so appreciate what you do and everyone else at Pfizer has done for us all as, as the human civilization. So keep well and keep those incredible breakthroughs coming. Thanks for the opportunity. I really enjoyed talking with you. Take care. Hi, and thanks for being part of the Purpose Power Summit 2021. We're thrilled to be joined by a great roster of speakers today, and of course, by you. It's been an amazing exchange of ideas, learnings, and goals, and we're not done. Stay with us to hear why UPS leaned into purpose during the pandemic, how Tom's innovates without losing core values, and the many ways in which COVID has changed brand consumer actions forever. Here's what's coming up this afternoon.
everyone, welcome back. We're excited to have you here with us at the 2021 Purpose Power Summit. I'm Chip Walker, head of strategy at Strawberry Frog. Uh, just so you know, there's a ton of fantastic back-to-back -back con content coming up. Up next though, I'm super excited to have a conversation with Laura Lane. She's the Chief Corporate Affairs, Communication and Sustainability Officer at UPS. Uh, it's a brand whose reputation, not just as a great place to work, but as a purpose-driven company precedes it. Uh, so Laura, welcome and thanks so much for being here with us. Thanks, Chip. I'm really jazzed to be talking about UPS's purpose statement because I think we saw it unfold uh, throughout this pandemic. Yeah, it, exactly. I'm so glad you could be here because it's such an ideal time to hear about you and your story, just given everything that's been going on in the past few months. I mean, obviously, UPS is always a super relevant brand, but more so than ever in 2020 and 2021. So why don't we could just go ahead and jump in then and maybe tell us a little bit about your purpose. So so how do you talk about it? Sort of uh, how did it come about? And um, uh, how, how are you thinking about it these days? Sure. I mean, everybody's familiar with UPS. I mean, our iconic big brown trucks were probably more ubiquitous than everybody thought possible during this pandemic. But many people probably don't know that UPS began as a message delivery company. We were founded by two Seattle teenagers over 114 years ago. And now, fast forward, we are a half a million employees strong. And we serve customers in over 220 countries and territories. And and deliver 2% of the world's GDP um, every day in our packaged cars, in our airplanes, um, and in cargo containers that move around the world. Um, and how did we get to our purpose statement? Well, we got an amazing new CEO, Carol Tomei. And when she came in, she said, you know what? I get what we do, but I don't know if everybody understands why we do what we do. And um, it's in that context that we thought it was really important to define that why about what role we play and particularly in this critical moment in history. So last year, we unveiled a new purpose statement. And, and I have to tell you, I think it was in the hearts of every UPSer throughout this pandemic. We just gave it life. We put words to it. Our new purpose statement is moving our world forward by delivering what matters. And it really has become our North Star. And in so many ways, that purpose has been what has you know, given every UPSer that courage throughout this pandemic to keep showing up and delivering because we knew so many people were counting on us. And as part of that purpose, we had a mantra that we've developed that be has become a kind of part of our mindset. And it's about being customer first, people-led and innovation-driven. And so from that perspective, we look at our customers and we say, we gotta think of you first, what it means to really be able to deliver for you without any kind of friction in the supply chains or friction in the delivery process. People-led for us meant, um, you know, making sure that people loved coming to work. I I'm so convinced that when you're joyful coming into the office or coming into your uh, the facility, you're going to deliver great service because you love what you do. And so to be people led, we wanted to make sure all of our people were jazzed about coming to work every day and would in turn recommend UPS as a great place to work. And then finally, I think one of the most important aspects of our new mindset, and, and I should say it's not really new, it's always been a part of who UPS has been, but we really gave it life by putting it into words about being innovation driven. And I have to tell you, through this pandemic, it's been all about innovating through the challenges and bringing new possibilities to the people that we've been delivering to around the world. Yeah, that's a perfect segue to the next thing I wanted to ask you about, though. I mean, thinking about the challenges of, of 2020 in particular and going even into 2021, you talked about uh, the nature of being focused on your customer and of innovating in particular during this time. So what was it about this time that maybe proposed some either challenges or particular opportunities for this, this purpose, but which I love, by the way, moving the world forward by delivering what matters? 
For me, when I see challenges, I see great opportunities. And I think every UPSer saw this moment in time and said, there are a lot of obstacles that need to be overcome, but UPS is up to that challenge. And so when the COVID-19 pandemic broke, broke out, we saw businesses, governments, and NGOs suddenly have to adjust and deal with all of this unprecedented demand for volume around the world. And everybody had to adjust fast because with the pandemic, you know, bearing down on communities, we had to figure out ways to get all of the critical supplies needed, um, you know, to people uh, as quickly as possible. So think about healthcare workers. They needed to have medical equipment and medicine and critical PPE brought in. Think about, you know, folks that were um, uh, making sure that they were following the stay at home orders, following the quarantines, well, they still needed essential goods delivered to their house. And think about all of the communities that were impacted when you think about people who maybe, uh, you know, were dependent on other sources for basic needs like food. Think about some of the school kids that, you know, depended on those lunches and breakfasts that were provided at schools. And then all of a sudden those were closed down. So there was critical food insecurity. UPS got involved in every one of those efforts bringing our logistics expertise and our know-how to be able to meet that need for that spiking consumer demand that we saw growing. And, um, and, and it was an exciting time to be part of UPS over the past 18 months because through all of those challenges, we found ways to deliver um, in, in new um, in, through new trade lanes, through new mechanisms that I think have re really revolutionized how UPS is delivering now and will going forward. Because think about it, a lot of the supply chains, a lot of folks maybe don't realize that a lot of the supply chains are infused with inputs from overseas. So you've got to figure out a way, not just to deliver from you know a, a distribution center to someone's residential home, you've got to figure out how to keep all the supply chains for the production of these goods going um, around the world. And so we saw everything is connected. And so a disruption in any single area can cause a ripple effect around the world. I mean, think about it, the Suez Canal, right? One boat shut down all of global commerce. Well, in the middle of this pandemic, we couldn't let that happen. And that's the cool part about the UPS network. When one lane was blocked, we found five other ways to keep delivering. And I think that's a testament to that purpose that was infused in every single UPSer saying, if one road is closed, let's figure out another way to deliver. If we have to take it you know, off the ground into the year, we can do that. Um, if we need to, you know, adjust supply chains and move production facilities to a different country and support efforts to produce new PPE, um, you know, in one location to another location, UPS can do that. Tell us a little bit about how maybe uh, so, some of what you guys did directly impacted people's uh, uh, experience with COVID and getting uh, vaccinated. Right. Well, we were involved in two uh, efforts, Operation Warp Speed, which was all about accelerating the process for getting critical PPE and medical equipment uh, out to communities, not just here in the United States, but everywhere around the world. But the one that I am so proud of the work of UPSers involves the distribution and delivery of vaccines. We knew it would take a specialized logistics effort to get vaccines vaccines delivered around the world. And, uh, you know, the numbers keep going, but we are at 300, over 300 million vaccines delivered in 92 countries, because we know that if everyone is, isn't safe, then no one's safe. So we want to be part of that solution of delivering those vaccines. And by the way, we want to do it not just in the easy places, but in some of the most challenging environments around the world. And I'm super proud of the fact that on the on our operational side, we figured out how to use innovation to get these vaccines to incredibly remote places. Just a couple of examples, Ghana, 
we delivered vaccines in partnership with Zipline by drone into the Ashanti region, a remote region in Ghana, to be able to ensure people have access to the vaccine there. We're doing it in countless locations around the world and here in the United States too. For example, the Navajo Nation is a great example of a partnership that we have struck with the, um, the tribal leaders there to make sure that no one is left behind in terms of equitable access to vaccines and UPS is all in and making sure we deliver what matters there. And I remember you guys used to talk a lot about we love logistics, which is great, yes. but uh, it probably isn't quite as emotionally motivating as helping move the world forward by, by what you do. So uh, I yeah. love that. Um, but I'm wondering, you talked about it, this being something that was already kind of in the DNA of your employees already, but, but I'm wondering how did you rally them around this new statement of purpose uh, when, you know, they were, a lot of your workers were kind of, I, I guess they were essential workers. They, they were out there facing health risks themselves. Yeah. You know, um, we did it through storytelling. We really uh, talked to UPSers as, as they were, you know, coming uh, into our facilities, as they were driving, and really tapped into their own stories and what was in their hearts about why they kept coming into work. And we also um, listened to some of the fears that they had and some of the concerns. And obviously, we adjusted our processes and methods so that their concerns could be addressed, but they could tap into that bigger purpose that they had um, for why they knew communities around the world were counting on us. And it wasn't a hard sell, I got to tell you, because um, uh, every UPSer recognized uh, the difference that they could make. And just getting them that governmental designation about being essential, I think it resonated with all of them because they thought, well, if not us, then who? The world's counting on us. We've got to deliver. And and they did. And they keep doing it, right? That's what the beautiful part of it is. Yeah. You know, there were, were obviously a, a lot of things going on in, in 2020, going into 2021. Obviously, we were dealing with the pandemic, which was, you know, right at the center of everything you guys do. But we were also dealing with like a lot of other issues, social unrest, uh, people concerned about uh, injustice um, and, and employees at all kinds of companies have been looking to their employers to um, have a point of view. Um, and, and I'm just wondering if maybe did your purpose sort of infuse beyond the pandemic some of the other issues that were going on in 2020? Absolutely. And, and, and when I think about our purpose, it's about more than just delivering packages. Um, it is about that greater force for good that we can be in the world. And um, so when Carol joined the company on June 1st of last year, it was a consequential moment. It was at the time of a lot of the social unrest following uh, the George Floyd murder. And uh, a lot of UPSers came together and said, you know, we need to think about that bigger role Role that we can play because we know that as UPSers, you know, diversity and inclusion are powerful um, uh, principles for our company. It's how our network works. We have an incredible diverse workforce and um, we're not, you know, we don't identify in political terms as red or blue. We're all brown. And it's that concept of what happens when you come together in unity um, and the strength that we have when we're stronger united that infused a lot of the activities that came together in that er in those early days right after Carol joined on June 1st. We actually used it as an opportunity to take what was already a part of who UPS is as a company and what our people believed and put it into action. We created an equity, justice, and action task force that's um, represented uh, by UPSers at every level in our organization. And we said, what more can we do internally? And what more do we need to be doing externally? And we developed action plans that have been operationalized now in really powerful ways. And one of the ones that I'm proudest of is 
UPSers naturally are amazing volunteers. You know, they, they think about um, how they can make a difference, not, you know, by delivering great service, but they also think about how they can make a difference in communities. And we made a commitment to 1 million hours of volunteer service in black and underserved communities. And I thought, you know, that's an ambitious and bold target to set, uh, especially during a pandemic where there's limitations on how you can volunteer, not for you. UPSers and not for UPS. People have been finding ways to engage in communities if they're not delivering packages or being a part of the network that's, you know, delivering great service, including delivering vaccines, by the way. Uh, they're also delivering what matters in their communities, finding ways to address those food insecurity issues, volunteering at food kitchens, uh, masked up, following all the safety protocols because they know how to keep themselves safe and healthy operations. So they're bringing that practice into their volunteer activities. We've already hit uh, 50,000 volunteer hours in just a short period of time. I know we're going to hit that um, that 1 million uh, goal uh, sooner uh, rather than later, just because of who UPSers are and how committed they are to making a difference. Yeah. Well, you guys have clearly done a fantastic job of, of activating your purpose internally with your employees and in your communities, which is fantastic. Um, just, I, I guess, uh, get, getting down to probably about my last question, because we're going to be out of time soon. But I'm wondering, though, you know, obviously, though, you, you guys are a business. Um, you need to do marketing. You've got to get customers. And I'm wondering, uh, can you t just tell us a little bit about how your purpose sort of infused the way that you were dealing with uh, external folks, especially like customers and, and prospects? Thanks. I mean, at the end of the day, UPS's purpose has to be about more than just, um, you know, delivering our profit for our investors. I mean, we see our role as being a part of a global community where we need to be advancing, you know, good among our entire stakeholder community. So we see that in the broadest terms, because if you're going to move our world forward by delivering what matters, it means delivering what matters for lots of different stakeholders our customers, um, our communities, um, our NGOs who we partner with to you know, change the policy environment and support for communities. Um, it, it means you know, being responsible corporate citizens in terms of how we uh, interact with the environment. I mean, if you don't have a healthy planet, you can't have a healthy business. If you don't have healthy communities, you can't thrive as a business there either. And if you don't have fundamental equity and justice in the world, no business is going to be successful. So we see our role in that bigger context, in, in the context of our purpose statement of working to advance equity and justice in our world, because that becomes the foundation for peace and prosperity. And UPS can thrive in that kind of world. So we want to help create that. Well, and create it. Uh, apparently, you have in the minds of the general public, because I, I uh, hope you saw, uh, Laura, that uh, UPS this year was one of the top companies in terms of being perceived as purposeful by by the general public. So, so I think people are noticing what you're doing, uh, and it just goes to show that when you develop an inspiring purpose and uh, and activate it the way you guys have inside and outside your company, that uh, people people do notice. No, and, and I'm, I have to say, we're proud of that, and that perception is important, but for UPS, it's about the reality, and we're going to just make sure we keep delivering that, because if our purpose means anything, it's not just about the words, but it's how we breathe life into the actions that actually accomplish that higher purpose that we've set for ourselves and uh, our people, so... Uh, I couldn't have said it any better. Uh, that's the whole theme of, of this conference. So, Laura, thanks so much again for being here. Appreciate it hearing all about UPS. Uh, and um, I think at this point, we will uh, move on to our next session. So thanks again so much, Laura. Thanks, Chip. Great talking with you. You too.
Hey everybody, I'm Scott Goodson, the CEO of Strawberry Frog. Hope you've enjoyed the content this afternoon. Here's what's coming up next. I'm Kylie Wright for the CEO of the RepTrack company. Welcome back to the Purpose Power Summit. We've had a great session of panels this morning, and we're about to continue our conversation on the topic of evolving purpose without losing impact. I'm delighted to be joined by Amy Smith, the Chief Strategy and Impact Officer at Tom's Shoes. We're going to talk about what it's like to be a pioneer in the one-for-one model and to evolve this strategy over time as they celebrate their 15th year of anniversary and impacting 100 million lives. Amy, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Likewise, it's uh, great to speak to a pioneer in the the space of bringing purpose to life. I'd love to start with a question about how does a purpose pioneer grow their cause without forgetting their roots? You've got a great history at Tom's and an incredible background to draw from in thinking about how brands activate their purpose. So tell us how it, how it feels to be a pioneer. Well, that's very kind. We are excited to be part of the movement of bringing profit and purpose together and really ensuring that uh, there is a way for companies to engage in purpose in a meaningful way. And so we're very proud of the work we've been able to do. We turned 15 this year and we're celebrating um, supporting 100 million lives through our impact work. So it is a proud moment, but it's also a reflective moment. It's also a time for us to really be thinking about um, what's next and, and what have we learned along the way and how do we take that next step in the purpose space? And so uh, although we were on, you know, maybe the front end of this purpose space and certainly on the front end of the one for one model, uh, we are just proud to be part of the movement and so excited that so many more companies are coming along and really making uh, purpose a core component of who they are and why they exist. 15 years. Wow, that is fast. You certainly punch above your weight in terms of brand. And certainly when we did our first uh, Purpose Power Index last year, Tom's was right at the top of the pack and has a very good track record on purpose. It was remiss of me not to mention explicitly the one-for-one model since you're so well known for that. Can you just remind us of how that all came about? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You know, our founder, Blake Mykoski, was the heart and soul of this organization for a long time. And really, he was a guy who was traveling the world and saw a need and wanted to do something sustainable about it. Uh, And so that need happened to be in Argentina and it happened to be children that didn't have shoes. And he thought, when I get home, I'm going to ask my friends to sort of gather up their shoes and we'll send them over and we'll we'll make sure that they get get to children. And I will tell you, we certainly have evolved a long way from that idea um, and really thought about how do we give effectively? How do we integrate um, shoe giving into these programs that nonprofits need them to be integrated into? And so um, that passion for doing something meaningful uh, and taking it that next step to being sustainable, to say, I'm going to actually start a business. And when I build a shoe for someone to purchase, I'm also going to build a shoe to be given. Uh, and that is really how One for One for Tom's was born. Uh, it wasn't going to be sustainable. And he really realized that right up front to ask his friends for their old shoes that maybe were not well fitted or Uh, activity appropriate or climate appropriate for the children that would need these shoes the most. And so um, we've really taken our time to build out uh, a network of nonprofit organizations that now had used those shoes in their programming to enhance the work that they were already doing. Uh, And so that is really a, a guy with a great idea building on that idea for the world to become a better place. 
Thank you. It's uh, it's great to hear the story, and it's always wonderful to talk about entrepreneurs and the impact they have on activating the purpose throughout the company. There are many companies who don't have the luxury of a founder still uh, in the orbit or with such passion, but I truly believe that companies like yours play a big role in moving them forward. What intrigued me is uh, your stated mission on your website is using business to improve lives. It doesn't actually say anything about shoes. And so I love that uh, you've made it broad enough to be able to be expansive. So you became successful and now there's many followers of your model, your one-for-one -one model. Right. How do you land on what's next? <clears throat> you mentioned you're in a reflective mode. How do you land on that? Yeah, we over the last year or so have really reflected and there's no doubt that the world around us is changing. There's no doubt that organizations and uh, nonprofits and companies are all facing a different world around us. And so we took that time, not only celebrating 15 years, to look at everything that we've learned and really ask ourselves the question, are we doing everything we can with the impact we are trying to have? Uh, and with the customer's uh, choice to purchase Tom's and generating impact that we feel great obligation to give responsibly against. And so we had dipped our toe over the last year or so into other models. We started thinking about um, gun violence that was happening here in the United States and really um, making a commitment to address some of that through a grant-based program. And we were looking at um, some of the issues that are happening in the world and how we might have a meaningful impact on those. And that meant focus. And that meant possibly ending our one-for-one -one shoe giving, and that meant possibly moving away from the one-for-one -one model overall. And so um, late last year, we made that bold move to uh, change our model completely. And so we now give one-third of our profits for grassroots good. And so a couple of things that are really important to note about that. One is that it's the same total amount. So the sustainability of the model for Tom's is unchanged. Right? When that consumer purchases a product, it still generates giving. We still put that to work. We're just putting it to work in a different way and a slightly more flexible model that really allows us to address issues at the grassroots level. So one third of our profits is still the same. That grassroots idea is what I want to talk about just a little bit next. And that really is around understanding what a community needs and how we can support them. So oftentimes companies will say, I have these dollars, I want to do X, Y, and Z. Nonprofit, will you go execute that for me? And there's nothing wrong with that approach. That's absolutely the you know, common knowledge approach. Tom's is taking the initiative to really flip that idea on its head a little bit because there are community leaders and organizations in local communities. They know what the issues and challenges facing that community are. They know what some of the solutions could be. They have the passion and the network to execute against those, but they don't always have the resources. And that's where we feel like Tom's can really come in. So we're really focused on entering a community in partnership with the leaders of that community and figuring out how can we use business to improve lives, giving one third of our profits to your grassroots effort to build more equity in the world. And that's sort of the last piece of the equation. Uh, equity and uh, the ability for all people to thrive is something that we're all having a lot of conversations about. And we've been doing research on this for over a year and a half, really understanding what are those issues and how can we play a meaningful role in that space. And so the foundational components of equity for Tom's and where we're investing is in mental health, access to opportunity, specifically work in school, education, and ending gun violence. We're going to continue to maintain our commitment there. So it's a really big change for us. It's a really um, big evolution, and we're really excited about it. And it's really making sense to our consumer. It's really making sense to the marketplace, and it's really making sense to the community of purpose-driven organizations. Wow, that is a big shift. And strategy is a long game. You have a hard role. Um, you must have done a lot of stakeholder conversations along the way. You mentioned a year and a half is how long you've been thinking about it. Was the decision a build-up or a very fast one once you'd actually done the research to pivot to this give-back model? Yeah, you know, I think in the in the research phase, we sort of, we went down a few rabbit holes and came back up sort of saying, mm, that's not the right fit for us, right? Because we really wanted to think about where can we have the greatest impact? 
What have we learned over 14 years? What's going to resonate for our consumer? And how can we all get excited about the impact that we're having, right? There's a lot of people that were really passionate about the one-for-one model. And so how can we say, and where, where can we have impact where maybe others aren't showing up as much, especially in the corporate space? Mental health is a huge topic and a huge issue for so many where all of us are having lots of conversations about that. Um, access to opportunity, right? When you have the ability to go to school or get a job, you feel much less hopelessness. And that takes you away from maybe making bad choices and ending up in a situation where there might be gun violence involved or ensuring that you have strong mental health. And so all three of these areas, although they might feel disparate, they're really intersected and they really impact one another. And so it's been a really um, thoughtful process. We've talked to customers, we've talked to partners, we've talked to our employees, we've talked to um, research, research experts, right? To really make sure that we were uh, implementing something that was sustainable, that was thoughtful, that was exciting, that was going to have a meaningful impact and that was going to resonate for our consumers. It was quite the game of Tetris for a year or so there. I'm sure, I'm sure. As a uh, student of strategy and lifelong pursuit on uh, getting leadership aligned behind the strategy, um, you know, mm-hmm. I applaud you for getting there. Far from feeling disparate, those three areas to me feel big enough that you could work on them for many years so they'll have longevity. And actually being purpose-driven um, requires the longevity piece. It also requires authenticity. So what advice do you have to other companies that are trying to find their authentic voice in unleashing their purpose? Yeah, that's such a great question. It's one we ask ourselves all the time. And so I think you use the word authenticity, but I think in order to be authentic, you do need to do your homework. You do need to understand why are you having the impact you're having? What problem are you trying to solve or contribute to in a meaningful way? And then how do you tell that story most effectively to your consumer and with your impact partner? So we do as often as we can sort of pass the mic to them. How do we give them our platforms to tell their story? They're the best storytellers of their story. So if we can provide the platform for doing that and really help them capture that, not only is it valuable to them for the long term, but it's the best way for us to help our customers understand what is happening in their community and how are they addressing those issues and why are we choosing to fund them? Uh, So, you know, look, there's always going to be people who are cynical. There's always going to be people who maybe uh, think you can do it better. And we have always been to your, I love your comment about being a lifelong learner, right? We've always said when there is criticism, let's take that seriously. Let's look at it. Let's try to learn from it. And let's ask ourselves, are these things happening? Are some of these negative things happening? And make sure that we're addressing that. Once you do those things, then when the negative comments come or um, maybe someone's feeling uh, apprehensive about engaging with you, you can feel really confident in putting your best foot forward, in sharing those stories, in talking about your lessons learned, and talking about the statistics that you're trying to address. What problem are you trying to support? Uh, And it makes that a lot easier. And of course, there's always going to be a negative voice out there. And I think at that point, you just sort of overlook them and keep going. Yes, it's important not to be swayed. Um, You've done such a nice job of that. And, uh, you know, congratulations on, first of all, like your great uh, adherence to your purpose, being bold and brave enough to actually uh, evolve in your strategy, and also to have such a great reputation in terms of doing and saying the right thing. So what's one thought you'd like to leave us with as we wrap up right now in terms of activating your purpose? It's one thing to have a great one and you're in a position where you started that way, but what's your your final thought for us on activating it? Yeah, you know, look, I think you have to believe in what you're doing. You need to have leadership buy-in. You need to be able to um, tell your story effectively and that's heavy lifting and hard work. And so... We have to embrace that part of it. I'm very lucky to have a team of individuals on the Tom staff that is working on this every single day, building relationships with nonprofit partners, ensuring that we're integrating with our marketing team to make sure we can tell that story effectively and on a schedule that makes sense for the rest of the business. These are things that 
I hope more companies invest in inside their organizations so that we can be that much more effective with the impact we're all trying to have, right? You think about all these, so many more purpose-driven brands out there. If we added up all the impacts that we're able to have together, are we really making a powerful difference? And so coming back and asking your question, yourself that question all the time, I think has really gotten us to this place, this new place for Tom's. Um, and so I would encourage folks to continue to ask themselves that, that hard question and continue to do the heavy lifting and hard work in order to have true and meaningful and authentic impact. Thanks, Amy, and thank you so much. Honesty is uh, always the right thing to do when you're trying to get to the heart of big problems. Congratulations on impacting 100 million lives on the first 15 years, and we wish you the best for the rest. Look forward to following the story closely. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you. If you're going to start a business, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, why just start a business when you can actually tackle real problems? There's a company that started about a year and a half ago called Courbet. It's in the luxury space of all places. This luxury jewelry brand started um, by being the first ethical uh, luxury jewelry brand making man-made diamonds or human-made diamonds, I should say, um, in laboratories. So diamonds are a currency like like uh, you know titanium or gold. So there's a fixed value associated with diamonds, whether they're blood diamonds or diamonds that are made in a laboratory, it's the same. Um, and so they created this brand and all the gold is recycled and their purpose is you can't be beautiful unless you're good. And they opened up a store in Place Vendôme, which is of course the cradle of luxury in France, in Paris. And they're just like a rocket ship. Younger millennials want diamond luxury jewelry brand that is also not destroying the earth, not digging huge holes, not doing horrible things to human beings. Hi, I'm Inc.'s Editor-at-Large, Tom Foster. I'm thrilled to be here for this session of the Purpose Power Summit. Welcome to Eye of the Beholder conveying purpose to consumers. Joining us today are three guests I'm very excited about. We have Miriam Banakaram, Head of Marketing for Nextdoor, Brian Deffa, CMO of LifeBridge Health, and Matt McGowan, Director and General Manager at Snap. Thank you all for being here. Um, welcome. So let's just jump in. Miriam, let's start with you. Um, I would love to hear all of you talk for just a moment about how brand purpose uh, uh, sort of comes to life in, in, in your own line of work, in your companies. Mariam, let's just start with you. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't actually think of it as brand purpose. For me, purpose is sort of the way Jim Collins talks about it in his um, book, Good to Great, right? It's really about your North Star and your business strategy. Um, it's the difference that you want to make in the world. Um, of course, you want to make money because you're in business, but what is the difference that you want to make in the world? And so at Nextdoor, our purpose is around um, cultivating kindness and enabling everyone to have a neighborhood that they can rely on. Um, that's really the organizing principle and the strategy that drives our business. From a marketing brand perspective, we actually think about how we communicate that and what that means to um, our neighbors, our neighborhood ecosystem on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we try and translate that in a meaningful way. But I think about purpose as a much more holistic idea. Um, and frankly, I always think of it, um, it's funny when I was in college, I took a course because I'm that old with Edward Deming. And he always talked about um, this idea of having a broad lens when you thought about your business. He didn't use the word purpose at the time, but to me, those are very interlinked because if you have a really clear North Star, and you think broadly about your business, you can actually pivot when other people can't, right? And he used to give this example of um, railroads not seeing the cars or the you know the carriages because they thought um, of themselves as a very linear business versus thinking about themselves as a business that moved body from place to place. And so I think when you have a broad um, definition for your business, it allows you to think about not only um, how you behave, but also in terms of M&A and other opportunities for innovation that allows you a much broader um, canvas. 
That's a great point. Um, Brian, let me, uh, let me swing to you next. I want to build on something Miriam said, which is, um, you know, Care Bravely is really, for us at Lightbridge Health, we're a large healthcare system in the mid-Atlantic. But for us, um, we're really about caring for the community in which we do business. And we needed, we had grown through acquisition like a lot of other health systems, and we needed that North Star. We needed something which was, you know, tied to our history, was true to who we are and what we sought to do, but really told the community and told our team members at the same time uh, and acted as a rally cry what we were about, why you should come to work for us, um, when you show up to work, what kind of behaviors we expect of you and how we expect you to contribute to their overall narrative. And what Care Bravely did was it tied back to who we are, um, what we've always been since our founding in the 19th century, but really put a modern spin on it. We're not just healthcare providers. We're not just deliverers of care and treating pathologies. We're, we're about um, being in our communities in ways that maybe a healthcare system wouldn't traditionally engage. So, you know, mobile health units, um, taking healthcare to the people on the street, having partnerships with um, African-American barbers and predominantly African-American communities to really promote the um, awareness of knowing your numbers and getting screened and early testing. So for us, it was really about taking what we had always been, which is a healthcare provider, but thinking critically about if we're really to be parts of our community, what does that mean in driving healthcare into the community where it's most needed? That's great. Um, Matt, I'd love to ask you the same question. How does purpose manifest uh, for you at SNAP? It's a great question. And, and I have to say, I'm, I'm in a complete agreement with uh, both my colleagues. But, and, and in that vein, I'd just like to add one thing, really. And it's that the consumer these days, uh, more than ever, is looking to purchase from brands, from companies that have a purpose outside of above and beyond generating profit. And in that vein, like for us, we, we Snapchat, we very much focus on the Gen Z and millennials. They represent 4.4 trillion, I believe, in global purchasing power, which is like something like 40% of global consumers. Um, and and what we see is that the overarching, uh, the you know, the vast majority, 82% of them in the U.S. and Canada, um, believe that they have a personal responsibility to create the change they want to see in the world. And they're going to buy from companies that kind of align with that uh, philosophy. So purpose is, is, is critical, I guess, the short answer. I, I would love to, let, let's stick with you for just a moment and follow up on that point. I think that... Um, how that has changed over 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 the last however many years is a really interesting question and i'm is, is it, it primarily, primarily about, about the new generation of consumers and how they how how the, what their attitudes are or are we seeing that sort of throughout the entire sort of uh, uh consumer base uh, across other generations of consumers as well yeah it's a good question i i remember when i was in school you know 30 years ago or so I was taught that like the sole purpose of a company was to create a dividend or a value for shareholders. And that was literally it. I think that was what the textbook said. Um, so I, my guess is that's changed. And I think if anything, like if we think about the status quo, I think one thing we can all agree on with what's gone on over the last year and a half, like the status quo has changed. Um, and if the status quo favors the incumbents, then it appears to me, I would guess, I would, I would assume that it's a really good time um, to pivot or to think about your business differently um, than maybe what we had all learned in, in school. Um, so is it is it just Gen Z and millennials? It's a good question. We focus primarily on that audience, and I must say, is definitively Gen Z and millennials that are at least you know trying to drive this change. But I think it's broader than that. I really do. Yeah, um, Brian, I want to uh, ask you. Um, uh, Matt was just talking about how things have 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 changed over the last eighteen months or so, uh, you know, through the pandemic. Um, obviously, in the line of business that you are in, you know, you've been really directly engaging uh, with this pandemic. How has purpose uh, changed for for LifeBridge over the last over the last year and a half? Yeah, Tom, it's uh, it's been quite the roller coaster, I will say. So. I wouldn't necessarily say it's changed uh, in healthcare specifically. I will say that it really has 
um, stripped away a lot of the day-to-day activity in the business of healthcare and really gotten centered a lot of us, even those who, uh, of us who aren't clinicians and really centered us around what we do every day, which is, you know, make people healthy and really impact their lives in kind of a, you know, a monumental or consequential way. So, you know, I wouldn't say it's changed it, but I, I certainly would say it's gotten more attention as to, you know, what we're doing here and the impact that we can possibly have. So it's, you know, incumbent upon us to really f- find that purpose in our own lives, but really, you know, put the pedal down on what purpose means in doing our job. It's not just people who walk in the four walls of the hospital. It's how we engage in the community to really make it a healthier place for all of us. Mariam, one of the things that I find really fascinating about Nextdoor, have always found fascinating about Nextdoor, is, is how it is, you know, this, this digital social network, but centered around actual physical communities. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in this past year and a half, as so many of us have sp- spent so much more time at home in those physical, those physical neighborhoods, those physical communities, um, I imagine you guys saw some really interesting changes in how people interact with that world, that physical world around them. And, and, and I'm curious how that manifested for, for Nextdoor um, in terms of, 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 of its purpose and, and sort of how consumers um, um, sought that sort of purpose. You mentioned sort of cultivating kindness. How, how consumers sought that purpose sort of differently over the past year and a half. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I When I first joined Nextdoor, I remember looking at that line to cultivate a kinder world where everyone has a neighborhood they can rely on. I was like, neighborhood they can rely on. I get that, right? Like you get on Nextdoor, you need a babysitter, you need a plumber, you've lost your dog. There's a utility case. I get that. I was like, kinder world. What does that mean? I mean, it seems so lofty. Um, and then I, I think I took the job three weeks before COVID. And then, um, you know, March happened and we saw the number of people on the platform who were offering and asking for help. Um, you know, you were stuck in place. And if you were immunocompromised, you couldn't go get groceries, you couldn't go get, you know, prescriptions. And so, I mean, there was an 80% increase in daily active users in that very first month. But what was remarkable wasn't so much, you know, the uptick in the business, but the actual need that you were solving, which was connecting neighbors based on proximity. And so the team quickly pivoted and actually enabled groups so that you could find each other faster. And one of the most remarkable things was that we had a map that allowed you to pin your house for trick-or-treating purposes, right? Because you want to know who in your neighborhood had candy. They took that map and actually made it into a help map. And so then you could see who was offering or asking for help in a visual way and actually figure out how close or far away from them you were. So, you know, it was really about being there meaningfully. It wasn't a gimmick, right? It was like people people were dying, right? This is serious. This is not about what's happening for my brand or my business. This is like, how can we actually be there meaningfully? And I think, um, you know, I live in Chelsea in New York. We I immediately set up a group called Neighbors Helping Neighbors. And then the map happened and we were able to say, oh, you know, here's somebody on 11th and 24th that needs help. Somebody was coming all the way from the West Village. Could we find her somebody closer? So that ability to support each other, I think, is what community is all about. And if there was a silver lining of the pandemic, I would say it's that we've discovered we over me as a society. Um, And this ability to want to help is actually, I think, Adam Grant writes a lot about. And you you began to see it um, in these last, you know, more than a year, frankly, right? We're all in place. You get to know the people. I used to say I was one with the team at LaGuardia and O'Hare. And now I actually um, spend time with Nathaniel and Troy and I get to see Joan at the coffee shop. But for months, we were just checking in on each other on Zoom calls or on Google Hangouts because, you know, Joan and her husband, Bob, um, who were in their 80s and 90s, hadn't left their house for, I don't know, eight months. Um, So that sense of like, not just caring about them or the people down the street who you occasionally come out and, you know, clap for the essential workers, but also all the small businesses, right? Our neighborhoods are an ecosystem. They're about the EMT workers, um, you know, uh, Stefan who owns Bergamot, Murray's Bagel Shop. It's like that whole vitality is um, critical. And I would say one of the interesting things is that we did research about our core and prospects. And what you noticed in the middle of the pandemic was that people literally used earth tones to describe their connection to place. So um, 
you're in a place, you actually are living someplace, you have an attachment to it. I'm very attached to the fact that I live in New York and I live in Chelsea. I'm a downtowner. It's part of my identity. And then as people dug into that, they would actually talk about plugging into the energy source of their neighborhood. They would actually talk about, you know, the bird watch. I mean, I was noticing that there were tulips. I'd never noticed that there were tulips in Chelsea, right? So you began to actually get connected to the ground. Um, and I think that that was definitely a shift that was happening because we'd all been so um, mobile, right? And all of a sudden you were in place. I think that's so fascinating. And I think in the case of Nextdoor um, in particular, I imagine this past year was was validating in a way of, of that purpose. You know, you can sort of have that purpose and pursue that purpose, but then to have this kind of unprecedented um, time in which that purpose is sort of more important than ever and the, the opportunities to sort of live up to it are sort of bigger yeah. than ever must have been really fascinating. Um, Matt, I want to ask you a version of that. How did that same um, kind of engagement with purpose manifest over these past 18 months? You, you mentioned, you know, that, 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 that it was sort of intensified over the past 18 months, but how did that, that, that really uh, come to life for, for you at SNAP? It's a great question, and, and similar to, to Miriam, I, uh, you know, we talk a lot about connecting individuals on Snapchat. Um, so if like before I can jump in, before I jump into it, if we can agree that like communication is key to any healthy relationship. And for a long time, we were not really allowed to spend time with those we have relationships with outside of our nuclear family. Um, we we kind of look to the camera and Snapchat's a camera company. And, and we believe that you know, reinventing the camera represents the greatest opportunity to improve, improve the way people communicate um, and live. And uh, very much, you know, in a similar fashion, whereas we're not necessarily um, focused on place like next door, um, we look at it, you know, more, you know, relationships. And what we saw was, uh, you know, it was interesting. Our, our first our concern was that if people weren't out and about, if Snapchatters weren't out and about, they wouldn't have anything to share. But um, what happened was because they weren't out and about, they leaned in to share even more, um, to stay connected with those that they love, their friends, colleagues, and family and such. Yeah, that's fascinating. Communication became more important than ever. Right, exactly. Fa fascinating. Um, so I would love to, 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 to pivot for just a moment and, and let's talk about, uh, 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 you know, from your experience, whether we can draw some sort of best practices um, in, in talking about brand purpose. I, you know, I mentioned at the outset that there's, uh, I always find sort of a tension between talking about a company's purpose, a brand's purpose, and making sure that that, 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 um, that language is perceived as authentic and not just sort of opportunistic. Let's stick with you, Matt. Let's let's. I, I would love to hear from your experience. You know, sort of some 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 best practices to share with our viewers about that. Oh wow, um, big question. Um, and I think there's no there's no one right way. Um, that said, I do believe it's about follow through. <laughs> um, it's it's easy it's easy to convey purpose. It's harder to uh, actually uh, realize it and 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 show it. Um, and, and so. For me, I think that's probably the biggest thing. It's uh, it's making sure that as a as a company, whatever purpose you've identified is your north star, that there's just a plan and it's operationalized and actionable to 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 go and do that. Um, so, you know, consumers at the end of the day, um, I think there was a there was the the purpose the brand uh, trust index that came out recently said something like uh, the companies are the most trusted source at the moment, above and beyond governments and media, which was interesting. Um, and if that's the case, then it's really, it's, it's up to us um, as, as you know, constituents and as, as, as executives within our businesses to, to kind of, to, to follow up on that and to, and to, and to make sure that we actually uh, live, live up to those, uh, those, those, those beliefs. Brian, uh, I'd love to, to ask you the same question. Can you talk a little bit about, from your experience, best practices in, in, in sort of talking about purpose in ways that are effective? One of the uh, most unleveraged strategic assets organizations have. And by that, I mean, we have to be intentional as leaders about sharing that brand purpose, sharing it internally, making sure that 
every team member is empowered to act upon it. So a lot of organizations, you know, enact strategies from the top down saying you will do this, you will do that. But if you crystallize really what your business is about and what you're there to do for people and customers, and then empower 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people to find ways in whatever their job is to live that brand purpose, that will create untold amounts of goodwill and assets for the organization far beyond what anybody sitting in the executive suite could ever do. Um, at Life for Child, what, what we try to do is crystallize that brand purpose, make sure everybody in the executive team understood it and was driving it into their plans, but then also communicate it to all of our team members and at the same time communicate the same words to our consumers. So consumer, executive, and team member alike were all singing from the same song sheet. So there was no miscommunication or distilling of a, a mission statement or um, anything like that. It was a couple of words uh, designed to be um, intentional, designed to be interpreted by whomever was reading them to our business and to the end user or consumer or consumer's family or a patient themselves. So I think it's, you know, it's incumbent upon leaders to give permission to say, you don't need us to say yes or no to your idea. You go implement the idea as long as it lives up to these two or three words. That's the power of what purpose really can deliver for an organization and ultimately for the consumer. Maryam, same question to you. Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, we live in an era of transparency. You don't own your brand, your consumers own your brand. In our case, neighbors own our brand. Um, I think it's about your actions and not just your words. I mean, you have to have words. We use words to communicate, but everybody's smart enough to know that it's actions that really matter. And so if I think about um, moments where you're at a crossroads and you use a framework, your purpose is your framework at which to make decisions, that's really the time when people actually say these people mean business, right? And whether it's your employees or your um, neighbors or your consumers, whatever it is, everybody's smart enough. And these days, everybody has access to information. So everybody's waiting for you to not actually mean what you say. And so actions are what matters. I think companies are purpose-driven um, it's about their DNA, right? And so if you if that's within the DNA of the organization and people believe in it, you're not trying to cascade it down. They're actually living it on a day-to-day -day basis. When I was at Hyatt, um, we talked a lot about this because we were a global company with 100,000 employees and we were a very operationally intensive company. And when we worked on our purpose, we were sort of giving people the permission to be authentic and actually come off of the playbook to be authentic in that moment because our purpose at high was around caring for you to be your best and care meant um, empathy plus action, right? So I see you in a moment and I can act. That meant that you actually had to give people permission at all levels of the organization, the guy who's checking you in, the doorman, to actually come off the playbook that was what they had historically used to operationalize a global company to actually be their authentic self in that moment, right? That was a pretty big leap of faith because um, what had enabled success was sort of these manuals and, you know, playbooks. So I think um, that's why I think purpose really matters. And people look to all levels of the organization to see examples. Um, and examples are much louder than words, right? And so when we made a decision to pass on a franchisee because they weren't offering health care to employees, because we said, if, you know, if we stand for care and you're not offering health insurance, I mean, that might be a great deal for us on paper, but it doesn't actually align with our purpose. That was a moment where the organization was like, these people mean business, right? And I think today consumers expect that from you. I don't think, um, you know, Matt's right. I don't think it's just about, you know, Gen Xers or whatever we, we call everybody these days. I think um, everybody understands the power of the purse. So, um, you know, with transparency comes um, privilege and the privilege is that you can um, leverage your words and your purse to actually affect change, right? And so people understand that and they expect um, people to step up. And, you know, Billie Jean King says pressure is a privilege. And I'd say all corporations now live in a world of privilege. And so if you, if you say you're purpose driven, you better be willing to back that up with actions. The flip side of that question, of course, is. Um, being purpose-driven, you use the phrase purpose-driven, I think is a great phrase. However, being purpose-driven doesn't get you a whole lot uh, unless you are also, you know, a sustainable business who can, you know, <laughs> remain purpose-driven, right? 
Uh, and, and, and I'm curious, uh, from, from, from any one of our guests, we're, we're, we're running out of time here. Can you talk for just a moment about how to ensure um, that talking about purpose and activating purpose actually drives the business results as well? Um, I, Matt, let me throw it to you. And, and, and what, what's your take on that? It's, it's, it's another good question. And, you know, it, it's, you can only make, when you make a decision, you kind of move down that path and you never really know what would have happened if you went the other way. Um, but for us, you know, we, we've tied our, you know, as I think, as Miriam said, we've tied quite a bit of our internal KPIs and metrics to various purpose that we believe, um, that we believe in and that our, our, customers, the Snapchatters, the 500 million Snapchatters around the world uh, believe in as well. Um, and there's no reason why, you know, you need to sacrifice growth or any of these other more kind of traditional KPIs when you focus on uh, the environment or, or healthcare or, or whatever it might be. Um, and uh, what we found is that by focusing on these these, you know, these various purposes that are important to our community, um, it's only strengthened the community and brought them closer together and, 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 um, and made our platform more popular. So um, I, don't, I don't think it's one or the other. I think we can, we can definitely do this together um, and, 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 you know, and see oversized growth and such. Brian, I want to let you close it out. What's your take on, on that? So in the healthcare space, it's really interesting because, you know, by our very nature, we create lots of emotional, high, highly charged emotional experiences for our customers, yet marketing and, and positioning in our space is still what Steve Jobs would refer to speeds and feeds. You know, this doctor has a better CV than doc, uh, that, that doctor. We have a new proton therapy machine. They have a new proton ther therapy machine. It's really about that one upsmanship and nobody has really owned that emotional, emotive space of th when you come to us, we'll pull out all the stops and do that for you. So what we saw as an opportunity, yes, we have to have the order qualifiers. We have wonderful doctors, we have great facilities, all the technology you could need. But then there's that emotional component that I don't think has, that is pervasive in a lot of consumer facing uh, industries, but it hasn't really reached healthcare. Um, so we saw an opportunity to carve out a unique space for us and really resonate with the consumer, um, make sure that they understood how deeply we felt uh, care for them and for their communities and how it's our driving force to carve out that emotional and strategic space so we're no longer playing this commodity game of you know, buying that doctor or getting that machine or whatever else. We felt it was important to own that emotional space and carve out something that was defensible long-term. That's great. Um, I want to thank uh, all three of our panelists for being here with us today. And um, uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was great stuff. What a great day. Such inspiring speakers. My name is Scott Goodson, and I'm the CEO of Strawberry Frog. And I'm Scott O'Malonek, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Inc. and Inc.com. And on behalf of Inc., Strawberry Frog, RepTrack Company, and our sponsor, Truist, we want to thank everyone for a truly informative and, I think, inspiring day. We hope you walk away from this Purpose Power Summit with a strong desire specifically to take purpose and bring it inside your organization, to galvanize your employees, to engage those outside your organization, and to drive positive change because we've seen that that's where the winners are. And the processes you learned today, the strategy, the execution should provide you the types of inspiration you need during times of great crisis like we've had over the last 18 months, but more importantly, for every single day moving forward. Yeah, that's right. And so thank you very much for the opportunity to share such a meaningful program. And we've had such an amazing collaboration and we look forward to future collaborations. And so until next time, stay healthy, stay safe, um, and stay purposeful, and enjoy the rest of your day.